So it looks like we're waiting for the chair and a number of the commissioners. So um, <laughs> everyone, I'm now, I'm now here. Oh, hi, Hannah. I didn't see you on my screen. That's okay. um, I was counting who is here. Richard, Hannah, John, Michelle. Um, Meg is here. Oh, it looks like everybody's here now. Sorry about that. I, they weren't here. Fantastic. Good. Okay, well, then we can hop right to it. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, especially to our new commissioners. I'm Hannah Stafford, um, and I am the chair. I've been the chair for, uh, well, I'm the sole chair for only like six months, and then I was co chair for a little while before that. Um, so I guess we're going to, we typically start our commission meetings by, um, well, we do the roll call. We're all here, as we established. And then we typically move right to the approval of the agenda. Um, but we can't do that because we have to officially have everybody on board. Um, so I think we can do, we'll do it the order that it's listed on the agenda. We can administer the oaths of office and then we can go around and um, do some intros before we get going. <laughs> So Carrie, that's you, right? Yes. 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 Sorry, I have I have some competition in the background. But um, the way that we will do the oath of office is you can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to all of the new commissioners have no. seen the oath, and what I'm going to do is uh, read a section, and all of the commissioners together, the four new commissioners, can read it. Um, at the same time, and then um, when it says the person's name, you can say your own name, and then we'll be done. And then after that, we can do introductions. How does that sound? Sounds great. Mm -hmm. So, Cash, Meg, quick question, and, Carrie. Yes. Am I considered a new or um, no? Okay. No, you do not need to do the oath. That's why I did not send you one. So it would be Michelle, Meg, um, Thomas, and Kiara. So you guys can all unmute yourselves. And then um, we'll say I and then your name. Hi, Hi Margaret Slattery. OK. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly, Do solemnly swear, swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support, will support and defend, defend the Constitution of the United, United States. States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution. That I will bear, I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution. Of the United States in the Constitution of the State of California. Of the United, of the United States, States and the Constitution of the State of California. California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take, I this, take obligation this obligation freely. freely. Without any mental reservation. Without, without any mental reservation. reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. <laughs> That I will well and faithfully discharge. That I, that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you so much for that uh, group reading exercise. Appreciate it. <laughs> that, that's almost Great exactly job. the same wording as the vice president. Yeah, right. <laughs> you noticed that? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to you, Hannah. To okay, so I think so. To do intros, we can start with the current commissioners, and then we'll um, we'll turn to our new folks. Um, so I started to give you my intro, but again, I'm Hannah Safford, um, and I've been on the NRC now for two years. And uh, the second year of that, I was either co-chairing or chairing. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student in environmental engineering at Davis, um, and Previously, I've jumped back and forth between the worlds of engineering and policy. I've had positions at um, the Forest Service, the City of 
San Francisco's um, Department of the Environment and it, it spent two years as a fellow in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy for the Obama administration. So I've personally been very excited to see that office start to get revamped. Um, and I have particular interest and expertise in water and ecosystems, though for a few years of my time at Davis, I was also affiliated with the Davis Policy Institute that does work on clean energy and sustainable transportation. Um, so I've dipped my toes in there as well. Um, I think that's, that's all that's mostly notable about me. John, let's turn it over to you. You forgot to tell us you were a Jeopardy contestant. Uh, I, was, I was a Jeopardy contestant. That's, <laughs> that's true. That was uh, in my, was my first tenure, uh, tenure on the NRC. But my I, only, name is, I only came in second. My name is John Johnston. I lived in Davis um, on and off since 19, 19, excuse me, 1976. And I'm a um, civil engineer by uh, training. And at the, at the moment I am, or at the moment for the last 20 something years, I've been a professor at uh, Sacramento State. I teach uh, civil environmental engineering. Um, again, I have a expertise in water quality and treatment processes. I also work for an organization called the Office of Water Programs at Sac State, which uh, does stormwater and general water consulting for state agencies and writes um, training manuals for treatment plant operators who you know, are all uh, licensed by the state. Let me see. And I think that I am now the senior member of the commission. I was the chair before Hannah, and I've been on the commission for six years. All right. Uh, Richard, do you want to go? Richard, you're on mute. I'll talk louder next time. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Richard McCann, and um, uh, I'm an economist at a small uh, consulting firm of, with two other people in, here in Davis. I've been in Davis since about 96. I've been served on a couple of city commissions prior, including most recently the Utilities Commission before I moved over to the NRC. I've been here a couple of years, I think. No. Yeah, you start, you, yeah, that's right. You started with me, Richard. That's right. Yes. Came over from that. It's all a blur at this point. Um, and um, I've, uh, I have actually have work, I work a lot in energy and electricity uh, rates. I was also on the um, commission or commission or subcommittee that uh, worked on creating the Valley Clean Energy um, uh, CCA and I've worked, um, I've worked a fair amount in water issues as well um, on the economics of those types of issues. So uh, a fairly broad range of experience. And David. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, glad to have see the new faces here and um, yeah, I'm one of the newer members of the NRC. I'm from Davis. And I've been working on, um, I don't know really what I'd call it, but like various regenerative community development projects um, within Yolo County. Um, most currently, um, you know, uh, working with the county to try to achieve this 2030 carbon neutral goal and really looking at things through the framework of a just transition lens is, um, you know, more driven by equity and like by frontline communities um, and how we can accomplish that. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, just excited to be here with y'all again, and welcome. Okay, and then we'll turn it to our new commissioner. So I'm gonna, for the sake of Zoom and having it not be awkward with people co-talking, I'll just call on you in the order that you appear on my screen. So Michelle, you're up first, welcome. Hi, I am Michelle Byers, and obviously I am new to the commission. However, I served for 
I think it was two and a half years, something like that, on the downtown plan advisory committee, which didn't operate officially under all the same rules as a commission does, but we sort of tried, <laughs> if you will. So we sort uh, of I, Yeah. <laughs> so I was gonna say I I may not be completely up to speed in all the all the rules, but I, I hope to get there soon. Um, I don't have a super expertise. I'm a generalist. My undergrad was in environmental science. My master's degree was in community development, um, focused on planning. I have an air quality background. I have a waste uh, background. I worked at the Yolo County Landfill for a couple of years. So kind of come from everywhere. I also have a very, um, very solid interest in environmental justice also. Fantastic. Um, and so your list is Margaret on my screen, but you go by Meg, is that right? Yeah, that is correct. Um, hi everyone, I'm Meg. I'm also a PhD student at UC Davis. I've been in Davis since 2018 and got my master's degree in energy systems over the summer and I'm sticking around to do a PhD. And my PhD focus is on the supply chain and end of life management for electric vehicle batteries. I'm very interested in generally the material demand that's required for the clean energy and transportation transition. And then I use um, kind of qualitative research methods and stakeholder interviews to understand the end of life more. And prior to this, I spent a few years going between working for a small nonprofit in rural Nicaragua and working in restaurants. And prior to that, I studied science, technology, and society at Vassar College. Oh. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to be the alternate member of the commission and learn more about everything that's going on. Yeah, fantastic. And we had one other, when I joined, we had one other PhD student, an energy PhD student also, and he was great, and then he left, and then I was the only student, so I'm, I'm happy to have more student company, too. Yeah, that uh, Greg, he, he was yeah. in the same cohort as yeah, me. Yeah, well, and then he saw that your name was Meg, and he was like, they'll never know the difference. <laughs> it's true, it's hard to tell us <laughs> apart. Um, and then, Kiara, am I saying your name right? Uh, Kira. Oh, oh just Kira. Kira Knightley, oh, okay. that's yeah, always okay. the... Okay example I use. Uh, so my name is Kira. I currently work in the Division of Water Quality at the State Water Board. And prior to that, I was working as a lobbyist in Sacramento for an environmental consulting firm. I received my master's in environmental policy and management from UC Davis in 2019. And Hannah, you actually spoke to my class. I was wondering what that timing if I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, prior to that, I was um, teaching kind of uh, with outdoor education groups in Southern California. And I went to UCLA where I got my bachelor's in environmental science. Um, in Davis, I've worked quite a bit with Puda Creek Council. And so I had done a lot of water quality work with them as well as with the Arboretum. And so I would say that my focus definitely has been on water and oceans, but I've also done a lot of work with uh, air quality and the Delta Stewardship Council. So I'm kind of uh, broad in my spectrum, but I'm very excited to be on the council. Fantastic. Um, and then we have one of our council liaisons here, um, Gloria. And so Gloria, I just wanted to turn it over to you in case you want to welcome our new commissioners. Uh, Hannah, I think we need to have Thomas um, introduce himself. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were above me, Thomas, on my on my screen, and so then I was going down, but I neglected to go up. <laughs> uh, no problem. It's my turn. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So uh, I'm uh, Tom Rost. I'm a professor emeritus from uh, UC Davis in plant biology. Uh, why I retired in uh, 2006, and uh, since I retired, I've been on recall, mostly doing uh, international programs. I've done work in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Morocco, Bangladesh, Nepal, and other places as well. Uh, mostly that has been uh, related to curriculum development and program review stuff. 
and I'm uh, happy to be on the commission for the first time. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what I can add to the commission, but we'll see. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, now, Gloria, did you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, I'm um, happy to be here. I don't usually, uh, I'm not usually able to get to this particular commission meeting uh, in person because it has conflicted with a with another um, commission, but we just did the, the big shakeup and so everyone's on a different uh, uh, liaison assignments. Uh, and so this is, this is one that I, uh, and particularly interested in, and so I'm just happy to be here and to and to listen in. Fantastic. Okay, um, so you guys should all have the agenda in front of you in one way or another. Um, so, do we have a move to approve the agenda? So moved by John. Okay. I'll second. All right. Um, and so then it, for the new commissioners, so the way we do it, so anything um, like that, approving the agenda, approving anything else, if we approve a um, resolution, um, that will always be a move and then a second, and then we'll go down, I'll call on everybody, um, and then you can be aye, nay, or abstain. So, Tom? Yes, aye. Richard? Richard, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. I'm too, too good at that. Uh, aye. John. Aye. Michelle. Aye. David. Aye. And Kira. Aye. Okay, great. Um, and now we will turn to brief announcements from staff, commissioners, and liaisons. This is opportunity to, yes. Do you so, want to vote so that we, oh, we did have seven. I'm sorry. You did vote? I just, vote, I, I just voted, wait, on, did you want me to vote on something else? No, on the agenda. I didn't know if you, I, I apologize. Yeah. I, we had, no, that yeah. was that. Okay. Did it. Done. Voted. Okay. And now we'll turn to brief announcements. This is an opportunity for anybody to raise anything that they'd like to bring to the commission um, that's not directly on the agenda. So this is an open floor. Uh, Hannah, I did have one question. Uh, yeah. In some of the uh, material that we got uh, mm -hmm. by email from Carrie, yep. uh, yeah. it said that the uh, commissioners are not allowed to talk to each other at any other time outside of the meetings. So we will, let's hold that and we will go into that more when we do our, um, our overview. Okay, we'll thank you. All right, thanks. Again. That was my question. Thanks. Yeah. Any announcements? Okay, then we can move past that and open the floor for public comment. As a reminder to the public, this is an opportunity for general public comment. So we are looking for um, comment on anything that is not on the agenda. We will have a separate public comment period for each individual agenda item. So we will go ahead and open the floor to public comment. I can see we've got a couple of hands raised. Let's start with Juliet. Hi, good evening. My name is Juliet Beck. I'm a parent here in Davis, been a resident for 13 years. Um, and I've been involved in a number of climate activities. Um, and I just wanted to echo the, the need for a just transition framework. Um, and I was, Wondering, I understand that this committee has considered the leaf blower ban, and I just wanted to present this as an example of why a just transition framework is really needed in the community. Um, the leaf blower ban went into effect during the height of the smoke, um, the wildfire smoke season last year. And um, my understanding was that it, it was, you know, passed by the city council, but the I don't know what the process was for informing the operators of the leaf blowers and how, to what extent they were engaged in the ban and crafting the ban so that they weren't disproportionately impacted by the ban and the people who actually operate the leaf blowers. And the example that the, the repercussions that I saw were that uh, Davis homeowners 
people in Davis started calling the police on the um, operators of those uh, leaf blowers who are often um, immigrant and, and vulnerable situations. And the last thing you want would be to have the police called while you're just trying to do your job in pretty extreme conditions exposed to the smoke yourself day in, day out. So I just wanna raise this as an example of how here in Davis, we could start to center uh, those that are most impacted um, by, uh, by climate change, by, by the um, decisions that this, this commission works on um, and that they should be represented in the decisions and crafting the solutions as we adapt and transition um, hopefully to a zero carbon future. But my, my neighbors were, my Latino friends and neighbors were horrified when that was happening, that police were being called and was reported on the news. So I just wanted to give it an example. And then just, you know, I, I think my time is up for public comment, but I have other suggestions about how to bring more of an environmental justice focus to the commission's work and seeing where it overlaps with other equity priorities for the city. Thank you. Yeah, Julia, thanks. Um, and certainly on, on all the topics you raised, if you wanna follow up with us more deeply um, outside of public comment, we would welcome that, especially on leaf blowers, that is, um, is an active topic. And, and so, you know, we're, there'll be an opportunity for, for deeper public engagement on that front. Um, okay, and we also have Alan Hirsch. Thank you very much. I sent some slides in. Can they be show, shown on the screen? Or? No, we're not going to um, just to set that precedent. I've heard a lot of issues with Zoom and public meetings and stuff coming in from not not from you specifically, Alan, but from the public about just when stuff isn't able to be pre-screened, but you're welcome, like I said in my email, to share those slides with the full commission via email, um, but we won't display them for this portion of public comment. All right, because the council seems to have accommodated and other commissions do, but all right. Um, I wanted to bring the, to the NRC attention that there's a new draft tree ordinance out. I hope maybe commission can look at that. How many? How long do I have? It's un unclear on the agenda. Yeah, you have three minutes for public. Thank you very much. It's not on the agenda. Um, so um, I'll do my best here. I was hoping the slides would help me through. So the, the commission, the, the it's, it's been 15 years since Tree Davis first requested a new tree ordinance. And we are finally there. It's great. About two years ago, the NRC wrote a cool parking lot policy statement that should be, would, it should be included in the, in the parking lot part of the tree ordinance. So you guys are involved and you should be involved with the discussion of this new tree ordinance. So I, I, I urge you to get involved. And we have a challenge here because the city has decided we're starting in the middle. We're starting with laws and ordinance before defining our policies. And that's a bit of a challenge because we don't have a policy to drive what the ordinance should be. So that's going to be a challenge, but I really encourage you to be involved. And uh, there's 20 documents involved with the tree regulatory process, not just the ordinance. So I'm concerned that basically we, by doing the ordinance without looking at the other implementing doc, implementing regulations, we aren't really have a, a full complete look at the picture. And final, and, and the, again, the proposed by the city is, is based on city staff input and input from the city of Citrus Heights, city of Folsom and Placer County and the city of Sacramento, which is a very interesting group of uh, cities to compare as peer, as peer basis. But finally, I wanna basically suggest that uh, you should get involved at your next meeting and particularly should put this on your agenda. I suggest you'd have staff presentation, also presentation with the Tree Commission subcommittee. And I suggest possibly some NRC people join the subcommittee of the Tree Commission to work on reviewing this, the, the tree ordinance before that meeting. Because with this year commission has formed the subcommittee and they would welcome NRC members. That was a discussion at the Tree Commission meeting last Thursday. I hope that's helpful. I hope you get involved. This is a once in a generation chance to do the tree ordinance and tree regulations right. Thank you very much for the time. Thanks a lot, Alan. And again, you're um, more than welcome to send out your slides to the commission via email. Um, okay, I don't see any other hands raised. So we will go ahead and close public comment and turn to our consent calendar. And the only item that we have on our consent calendar um, now is our November meeting minutes. Although I do want to raise one thing is, Carrie, so you had sent around that um, document about, um, oh, now I can't remember what it was called, but um, with like, like protocols for ensuring it was like the, about like equity, oh, yes. it was, was recommended that that 
that commissions either just kind of like look at it and have it be circulated by email or it could be on the consent calendar, but it doesn't need to be on the consent calendar. Um, I That I circulated. Yeah. And, um, it's something that we can talk about during the orientation um, PowerPoint. Okay. If people have more questions about that, similar to Tom's question earlier, which fall under that category. Also, there will be a training for all commissioners um, at some point in February, which is not yet announced, but that will be coming up. And so that will be available by Zoom and that will help uh, fill out more information about, about what those protocols are. The other thing that I sent to each commissioner here, probably not exactly the right time to talk about it, but the um, conflict of interest zone maps for each of you. So that's another thing that will be addressed. Um, as I've said to all the new commissioners, and as all of you know, many of these things evolve and we learn more about them as we work together as a commission. So there's no need for everybody to know everything all at the outset. Um, so the intent of that email was to let you know that there are due process components and that there will be a training coming up um, and it was not attached to the consent calendar. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we don't need to have it on the consent calendar, but now we know the text of questions, right? Okay, so just the minutes. Um, do we have, is anybody who, who was here in November notice anything problematic about the minutes. Um, and I will draw your attention to the fact that the minutes also had an addendum at the end, which was additional information provided after the NRC meeting based on commissioner questions. So it's um, both a recap of what we did and also a little bit of additional info. And Hannah, I will also note that new commissioners are allowed to comment on the minutes or and or vote on the minutes, even though they were not there. So um, they can't, obviously, since they weren't there, comment on content accuracy, but, there may, but they are um, allowed to vote on approval of the minutes. Sounds good. Anybody have anything to say about the minutes? Gary, I'll tell you that they were extraordinarily detailed this time. <laughs> You must have had some extra time on your hands. But they, I have no, I have no. I, no will, uh, I will comment, John, that they are usually detailed. They may not always be detailed to your liking. However, they are usually detailed. <laughs> no, it was the word extraordinary that was different this time. I recognize you do write detailed minutes. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I have no comments about them. Okay. No, I didn't have anything. Okay. All right. Uh, so move to approve. Move to approve by John. All right, I'll second that. And we'll vote. Tom? Yes, aye. Okay, Hannah's an aye. John? Aye. Richard? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Kira? Aye. And David? Aye. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. And now we will um, move to our regular items. So we're gonna start with the CAP informational update and we're doing that before we do our orientation, um, just for the sake of allowing our guest speaker to be here for as little time as she has to be. Um, so, so kind of just bear with us, all new commissioners, if you have any like process questions, feel free to raise them um, right now. Process questions or past history questions, feel free to raise them right now, but this will be mostly an informational update, not an action oriented item. So um, just immerse and then we'll turn to some more kind of like commission nuts and bolts after that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie and Diana. Thank you. So I'm Diana Jensen, the city engineer for Davis, and I've also been um, uh, volu volunteered to do the uh, project director for the CAP. The CAP is the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, 
and Carrie is our uh, project manager and she uh, will be doing the bulk of the work and I will be helping usher it along and, and being involved in the process. So Carrie, am I able to share my screen? Uh, you should be able to. Um, Jennifer, can you make sure that Diana can share her screen as a panel? I, think I got it. Can you guys see that? Okay. So this will be a quick presentation. I just wanted to give everybody an update of where we are in our process. Let's see if I can advance the slides. There we go. So a uh, quick overview of the project. We'll just go through the project description. Uh, we basically have three elements of um, input. There's a staff team that will be involved. There'll be a technical advisory committee that will be providing technical expertise. And then we are going to have um, community outreach. And then we'll touch on the project schedule. So the CAP project description, this is an update from the 2010 CAP and will establish climate action and carbon reduction policies to bring us into compliance with current state legislation. Um, and the big part of the next paragraph here is that we're accelerating our goal of being carbon neutral. It was 2050 and we're now pushing for a 2040 target. So we're um, gonna try to, the, the big part of what the CAP is going to do is provide us a, a roadmap for how we're gonna implement these things and make it happen. So our three elements of input, we have a city team. This includes a city staff a project management team, uh, which is Carrie and I, and then an interdepartmental internal staff team, which uh, will include um, members from each city department. Our consultant who is AECOM, they have a lot of experience in this area and uh, city council and then commissions. And the commissions will be involved just by getting updates from their staff liaisons and be very aware of when community meetings are happening so they can be involved that way. The technical advisory committee, this includes local and university technical experts representing significant areas of expertise and knowledge related to the development of the CAP. Um, this is really uh, input for staff who is writing the report and it's not, um, meetings are not going to be open to the public. So it's really a technical group that will get together to look at all the different um, things that we're evaluating and offer us their expertise. And Carrie did attach to the email today, the um, types of people we are going to be inviting to that. So we've got that list and those invites are going out this week. And then community outreach. So we are going to be doing um, online surveys and workshops, uh, maybe doing pop-up at a community events, depending on how, what, how we're doing with COVID throughout this year. And then we are working on a CAP dedicated webpage and we will have a specific email. So if people have questions or comments on stuff, they'll, there'll be an email that um, can be read by both Carrie and I. So our city team, again, it's, it's some, somebody from each one of these departments. In uh, many cases, there's two or three individuals just because of their uh, individual focus from these different groups. So that's the city team. And then the NRC role. So um, your commission will be the lead advisory body for the CAP and responsibilities include receiving quarterly updates on the CAP progress. Um, and to share details of your own climate related experience, subject area information um, and, and thoughts on efficient use of resources, provide input to the CAP process and prioritization of carbon reduction actions um, related to the city of Davis and through your role as both Davis citizens and um, local experts in these issues. And then especially as we get towards the end and we're starting to uh, want to implement these things to participate and help spread the word about you know, how the public can get involved in the initial um, community meetings and things that they can do to participate. And then um, to review and comment on the draft cap when we, when we get to that point, when we have a draft document to, um, to review that and help, help comment on that. 
So project schedule, I'm not going to go over this in great detail, but we, we did our uh, department heads meeting uh, um, update uh, last week. And this week we're going to be sending out the invitation to the TAC members. We are working on the website and hopefully launch that by the end of this week. Today we're here with you, giving you an update of the project. And then in early February, we're going to be doing a, a press release so that the community knows that this project is getting launched. And then also in February, we're going to have both our first um, city internal meeting and then the first TAC meeting. And then March is when we're going to be doing our online survey for the community so that they can participate in that before we do our first community workshop, which we are targeting to be somewhere around um, Earth Day. I'm guessing in April we'll still be doing Zoom community meetings. Um, not sure yet, but we'll, that'll be our first, first target uh, workshop. And then we'll also be targeting a second workshop in July. And I have these you know, 2A and 2B, they're basically the same workshop, but we're gonna try to offer it at different times so that if somebody is more available during the day, they can participate. And then we'll have one in the evening as well, or maybe a weekend. And then city council will be, um, we'll provide them updates on an as needed basis. We'll be working closely with Mike Webb to decide how often items need to come to the city council. And then to be determined is our uh, third workshop, which will be similar to the second one, will be the same workshop, it'll be offered twice. And then the fourth workshop, and then somewhere in there we'll be doing a second online survey with the goal of having you know, a draft report to this group and a final report um, that hopefully we can be done by December. So it's roughly a year process and that's the schedule so far. So city team meetings, right now we are going to be targeting the second Wednesday of the month for um, about an hour. And then the technical advisory committee, we are going to target the fourth Wednesday. Uh, we're, we're shooting for a minimum of six times. It may end up being more than that. So uh, just trying to figure out how often we can get um, this group of expertise together. So hopefully at least six times. And then commission updates, there will be a, a brief written update that will be provided to each commission on a somewhat regular basis. And many of the staff members who are in the city team meeting are also staff liaisons. So not every single one, but um, that'll help that update. And then for our department heads, we'll be updating them court, either quarterly or uh, more often as needed. And then I just have up here the same attachment that Carrie provided to you today. This is the stakeholder group. So this is the, um, <clears throat> the, the types of people that we're going to be sending this invite out to. And so we'll help, like I said, we we'll hope to get that out this week. So Carrie, did you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, I think that was a really great overview, Diana, and the commission did receive the staff report as well, which expands on a few of these points. Um, and uh, I would just like to say that um, I know that the commission, those that have been on the commission for a while have seen the progress of this um, pro project. And now that we're beginning to implement it, um, or to at least develop the plan, um, it's really exciting to have Diana on board um, as the city engineer and to have a multidisciplinary interdepartmental team within the city. And the whole point of what Diana has just presented is to have broad-based input to this CAP project process from the community and staff and the consultant so that we can ensure an actionable and measurable plan to get us to carbon neutrality by 2040. And we have a great start with the 2010 plan, but that needs a lot of work to make it a really enforceable plan um, with a clear path. So um, I just wanna say thanks to Diana for being here with us tonight so that you can meet her and ask any questions that you may have. Okay. Yeah. And thanks. And I appreciate the um, conciseness. It's an engineer for sure. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, let's um, go ahead and open public comment on this topic and then we'll open the floor to discussion. So let's see, we have um, Alan raising his hand again. So Alan, go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Okay. I just want to emphasize that 71% of our greenhouse gas inventory is from transportation, people driving cars. And I'm saying the transit is really, really important and much more important than just all the, just about everything else in reality. And that means two things. One, we need to focus on transit. And I said Yolo bus should be part of our discussion here and Amtrak and those sorts of issues because we have people coming in and out of the city and those are part of our carbon footprint. And also suggest that Caltrans, because we're talking about widening I-80, how's that gonna happen? That's moving in the wrong direction. How are we gonna manage that so we're not encouraging more trans people driving into our city? So I mean, and also housing, because we need to have more housing in our city so people don't have, have to commute so far. So those are part of our inner relationship of, because transportation is, is three quarters, almost three quarters of our carbon footprint in our city. So thank you very much for listening. Hey, Colin. And we'll go down to Juliet. Hi, am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great, thank you. Um, thank you. I am interested to hear more about how equity will be evaluated and prioritized within the CAP planning process. We heard a wonderful presentation with the Climate Compact recently on the equity process for um, the city of Oakland that they pursued with an equity-based consultant that was had expertise in that. And I'm, I'm concerned that the level of technical advisory capacity that you have, it doesn't reflect equity anywhere in that technical advisory um, commission or, or, or committee. And I'm wondering how you're gonna be prioritizing that and my concern is also with frontline, um, already we have, like I mentioned, the outdoor workers, the laborers as frontline community members that are most impacted right now uh, as the climate is changing. And so will they have a presence and be able to participate um, equitably in the process of designing the cap? And to do that, I think you're gonna need some funding for um, participant um, stipends but you'll need to be able to compensate people who are um, usually blue, like blue collar workers or, or farm workers for their time. So just even in the design of your public outreach and engagement, the assumptions that you make that there'll be volunteers able to volunteer and dedicate their time will essentially exclude people who are the most impacted by climate change, who have the most at stake in the outcome of this process. And I just wanna, to also underscore the, the, the need for transit and a visionary, a visionary um, objectives around something like universal access to bikes and neighborhood-based resiliency is a key aspect of a just, just transition. So from the experience under COVID and the pandemic, we've seen how important it is to build up the resiliency at the neighborhood level of families and communities helping each other, neighbors helping each other. And that's that kind of ethic of that, that locally rooted um, solutions um, to getting basic needs met in, a, in your local community within walking distance or biking distance and that level of community design, I think it's gonna need to be central to uh, Davis's recommendations. And I hope that will be central to your um, cap planning. And I'd like to know what progress has been made in 10 years, kind of where are we? Yeah, you've got about 20 seconds left. Okay, yeah, and just love to hear, is there is there a sense of, you know, what progress, how are we on track um, to meeting the reductions? Because you need at least 9% emissions reductions annually. So those annual metrics I heard are going to be also really key to see, keeping it, the city on target and the community here. Thank you. Thanks. And one more hand, Joe. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Wonderful. Uh, good evening, Davis NRC. Uh, I agree very strongly with the previous two uh, commenters. Um, the Davis community does not have any hope of achieving its climate change goals without addressing travel that crosses the borders of Davis, starting in Davis, going outside or um, outside coming into Davis. So regional transit service, 
uh, highways uh, need to be uh, very meaningfully involved in this process from the beginning if we're to address um, the majority of local emissions which come uh, from uh, transportation. Uh, I also agree that equity um, and equitable land use need to be fundamental to um, any useful uh, climate plan for the Davis community. Uh, and I'm very curious about the uh, motivation for um, closing the uh, technical advisory committee to uh, the public. It seems to me that there would be a, a tremendous amount of value in involving the public um, in that process, maybe not via um, live public comment, but at least publishing um, a detailed transcript of what was said and what was determined uh, during that meeting. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm very excited about this process and I'm very glad um, at all the, uh, the skill, expertise, and um, excitement that's been uh, gathered together for it. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. I think that's the end of our public comment. Okay, so now let's um, open up the floor to commissioners for discussion. Um, let's start with people who have any clarifying questions directly for Diana, and then if we wanna have a little bit more of an um, informal discussion or comments, then we can. So clarifying questions. Um, yeah, just, uh, this is Richard McCann. Um, my first question is about on the technical uh, advisory committee. Do you have the names of the individuals that you're contacting? And are they, are they gonna be generally Davis residents that are involved? So, um, I mean, we have the group that we are sending out the invites to. We don't have names to share right now. We wanted to make sure we had people who had the freedom to say yes or no without kind of being put on the spot publicly. So um, as soon as we have responses and we know who's on the, the commission, we can um, share the names. And but, but you have specific individuals in those organizations that you're contacting. Yeah. You're not yes. just sending generally to UCD, right. ITS, no, no, for example. Yeah, no, we, right. have, we have people, yeah, identified. And, and if somebody's identified <laughs> who can't participate for whatever reason, we've asked them if they have an alternate that, you know, in their same expertise who they could recommend. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Others for clarifying questions? Let me, let me ask. Diana, what's the difference between a shareholder group and a technical advisory group? Um, I don't know that we are identifying a difference. Carrie, do you have a... I think you're talking about, John, are you talking about that one slide that had both the world words TAC and stakeholder group on there? Yeah. I think it's the stakeholder group was the, the organizations that are being tapped to be part of the TAC. Um, well, I think more accurately, there is a technical advisory committee that will be a specific group. Stakeholders could be considered anybody that is a stakeholder, and we will be targeting stakeholders during the community engagement process. So that, I think that's the distinction. I don't okay. know shareholder was a term, but stakeholders are, we know that there are a lot of people in Davis, including those that some of the public commenters uh, spoke about that we want to make sure are engaged in the process. Thanks, Carrie. And last call for clarifying questions. Okay, and then so let's open the floor for um, a little bit more general comments and thoughts. Could we uh, put the the uh, slide back up, uh, showing the list? Which list? The stakeholder list, the attack list. Yes. Okay, so I have three serious concerns about this. And the first is that I agree with what Carrie just said, that stakeholders are people who have a stake in the outcome and the direction, but stakeholders aren't necessarily technical experts. And so I'm the, my, my comments are, I'm an academic and I'm a technical person, I'm an engineer, and I'm gonna argue that the TAC has too many academics and too much technical expertise on it. So um, no, technical 
physical technical expertise, uh, engineering type of expertise, and not enough of another kind I'll describe in a moment. So in terms of stakeholders and technical advisory, there was the Davis Chamber of Commerce. Uh, with all respect to the Davis Chamber of Commerce, and they certainly are gonna be a huge uh, stakeholder. I don't think that they would be the technical expertise that we're looking for. Um, I think one of the, the areas of technical expertise that we're missing out of this is that financial and implementation part that the governor's office and the Davis Chamber of Commerce are two ends that really don't help us so much. I think we're really looking for folks who can tell us how to, how to finance changes in the city, how to provide economic incentives for communities and for uh, homeowners to make changes, um, how climate and local business, um, um, the local business environment interact with each other and opportunities to go forward or to use the climate uh, plan to foster certain kinds of, of um, business. I think more of the kind of expertise that, uh, what's his name? Joe Mancucci, is that right, Carrie? The expert who came into, yeah. That kind of a person is what we, is, is, you know, not that person, but that kind of person who has the broader experience about this, how to motivate and uh, economically um, incentivize folks is what we need more than the governor's office, which is way up here, and the Davis Chamber of Commerce, which is way down here. So that, that uh, implementation part is one part that I think is missing off the Technical Advisory Committee. The second part that I think is missing is what I would call maybe the mid-level. And a couple of the public commenters uh, mentioned this as, as well. You know, we have folks here listed for um, uh, residential um, uh, residential reach codes and, and reduction in, in water and waste um, at a household level. And then down in transportation, we have electric vehicles and, and active transportation and traffic management. But traffic management is not the same as transportation demand management. And uh, Unitrans is perhaps not the best representative of our total transit system or our, our total, you know, I'll leave it that way. In the, in, the, uh, in the Davis Commons, no, the Aggie, Emmerich, <laughs> um, in, the, in that uh, um, um, CEQA document, it pointed out that an awful lot of folks commute in and out of Davis for their jobs they don't have jobs here. And that, that part, I don't see as being covered well by the folks that, that are listed on the right-hand side. I'd like to see some, um, so traffic demand management, regional transportation, um, mid-level um, urbanization, neighborhood planning, densification, land uses, that and, and how the cap is going to connect into the general plan. This doesn't seem to be represented well on the TAC as well. And the last one at that level is uh, electrification, electric systems. So um, we don't have anything here about that's going to address substation, electrical grid design, microgrid, the role of microgrids, um, which is that, again, that mid-level that is needed to implement or to make a plan work. So. Uh, let, me, let me summarize. Let's separate stakeholders from technical advisors. Let's get some more people in here to do, um, to look at the implementation side. So these are kind of the social science and economic type of folks and a few less engineers. And let's look at the mid-scale mid, mid effects, the, um, um, the electrical grid, neighborhood planning, um, I think I mentioned one other thing. Oh, the transportation in and out, not just the neighborhood transportation. Uh, and let me stop there. So those are my comments back on the TAC. I think, I, I think it'd be worth taking a real look at. Oh, there was one more comment that I wanted to make. 
um, a lot of we have a lot of academics academics here. Let's be sure to look for people who are doing this stuff. Um, there's the UC Davis Energy and Efficiency Institute, great organization, but there's also the UC Davis Facilities Energy and Engineering Group that actually does the, the retrofit of the UC Davis buildings. And I think having that kind of boots on the ground um, experience would help us in developing a practical uh, cap. So I think with that, I will, uh, I've said my two, my two cents. So David, you've got your hand up and then I want to add on to what John said. Sure. Yeah, thanks for this presentation. And um, I'm excited to see the cap process get started. Um, one thing I, I want to bring up, um, I don't know if it's a concern or um, something else, um, just making sure that the process is not you know, doesn't just check the boxes for community inclusion, but actually facilitates a process that it's community, you know, it's, it's commun led by the community, taps into the expertise within our community, which is so big. And also, um, you know, the stakeholders, you know, including people in the stakeholder group, the technical advisory committee that are directly representing the people that are at the front line of the climate crisis. Um, and, um, not just you know academics that are you know research this kind of stuff, but the people that are um, just to make sure that those voices who are affected most by these issues are heard. And because I feel like that's if we're trying to drive a cap process through the the um, technical advisory committee, um, it needs to have the needs of like real people represented, and I think mixed in with the experts. So just rethinking about you know. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, like, we focus a lot on greenhouse gas emissions and carbon neutrality, which is hugely important, but also what do we want as a community? That's designing the cap process and, you know, the sustainability of what does a sustainable Davis look like as the climate changes, because we're already, you know, there's going to be impacts that are greater and greater. So we need to both be reversing, you know, our impact on the climate and preparing through community development. So I think having community groups, especially frontline groups represented in the, in the TAC is, is crucial. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to see this process unfold. The other thing too, I, I saw the slide, it says that the NRC is the lead advisory body, but I got a sense it was more, you know, like every three months um, we chime in. I'm, I'm curious, not just like with NRC, but how do we tap into the, you know, the vast resources within our community of, of experts um, not just in the technical advisory committee, but, um, or, or the community, um, the days for the community workshops, but make it a whole process where we can bring in everybody on it. Cause we're going to need all hands on deck for this effort. It's a huge mobilization that no one's ever done before. Um, so I think we need to just figure out a structure and a process that's inclusive from the get go and taps into all the community resources we have available. So yeah, I'm gonna... Thank you briefly build on what John and David said, because it's along a similar theme, and then maybe give um, Diana and Carrie an opportunity to respond if they want. Um, I think that both John and David are right, that there's some stuff that's missing from this stakeholder group. I can also put myself, you know, Diana and Carrie into your shoes and be like, well, it's been difficult enough to schedule meetings with 16 people. You know, how many more people can we cram onto this committee? And I also recognize that invites have gone out. And so I, I don't know, um, you know, how much opportunity there is to change the composition of the stakeholder group at this point. But I see a fair amount of redundancy with the overlap in um, UC Davis institutes, like I said, you know, I used to work for the Policy Institute and like the Policy Institute is a subunit of ITS and works really closely with EEI and, and some of having the stakeholder group that meets monthly is not necessarily that you have to have all of the subsets of expertise in a given field represented at the table as long as you have one person who knows all the right people that's fine you know if you have one person from the policy institute and a technical transportation question comes up they're going to know the person at ITS to ask about so you don't really need to have both of them represented at the table so I would try and consolidate some of those centers into one 
individual who, who has the network that spans all of them and then use some of those spots that have been opened up to try and get the practitioners, um, the people who are doing stuff. And, and I would also love to see, um, as long as we're Christmas treeing this thing up, <laughs> I would love to see um, people who come from areas that can assist with implementation of, of a creative forward thinking cap even if it's not necessarily climate and environmental science per se. I'm thinking of two areas in particular. One is um, behavioral science. How do you get people to actually do stuff and change stuff and tapping into the whole field of behavioral science and social psychology. Um, and then two, somebody from like the tech side of things, somebody who's savvy with apps and building websites and technical outreach and just having it be like a really modern, inclusive, encompassing effort that reaches people instead of, you know, a report that looks like all the other reports. And again, you get like one behavioral scientist on there and that taps in you into a network of this whole area of behavioral science. You get one technologist on there and then you've tapped into that whole area versus, you know, if you get three transportation people working on three slightly different elements of transportation, you've got that well uncovered, but you would with one person anyway. Um, okay, let me, I'll, I'll stop also and you can, so that we're not just constantly talking at you, Diana and Carrie, and I don't know if you have thoughts to share. Some of this I'm sure has crossed your mind already before us. Yeah, I'll let Carrie respond because she put a lot of thought into this list, but I would just say that some of the things that you've brought up, like the IT specialist, you know, don't forget that part of our, our you know, three legs of input include our, um, our consultants, AECOM, and they have done a lot of work on CAPS before. They do have a lot of uh, expertise in-house as well as the staff that we have, our staff internal meetings with our, with our own IS department and, um, so yeah, there's, there's, it is hard to, to figure out who all to include in this list, trying not to make it too big, but um, I hear what you're saying about the, you know, behavioral scientists that could be really interesting. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that were my thoughts, Carrie. Um, just to make sure, were there other commissioners that had comments or thoughts or? I was, I was gonna open it back up again. I just figured oh. I would let you check in okay. so that okay. we don't barrage you all at once. No, that's great. I, I, I think um, that this is exactly the kind of input we need. Um, specifics are better than generalities. Um, we are still open to some additions to the TAC, although we do want a fairly lean group um, what I would assure you is that with the individuals that we have identified for these various topic areas and organizations, we've really focused on people that are um, broad thinking, multidisciplinary, and will have more than just, more to offer than just their area of expertise. And so, um, you know, we don't want to share the specific individuals with you right now because that wouldn't be fair before we have gotten responses back from them. Um, but um, we do, we do have, um, we do have people that we think cover many of the topic areas that you have um, focused on. We do want this to be a technical advisory committee. It is not to replace the community engagement or the internal staff team, which has a lot of the implementation expertise that you're talking about, or to replace the consultant. And they have a lot of experience. They've worked on some of the topic areas and plans that have been developed for the topics that have been introduced by both public comment and the commission as far as equity and um, behavioral science and um, you know they were part of the background for the Oakland plan that Juliet sent you some information about um, from the recent climate compact. Um, they developed a lot of those um, tools that were used in that plan. So again, we, um, we welcome your suggestions and input. Um, however, we also feel that with the three-legged um, 
uh, set that we've that we've put together for the the structure of this plan that we have. We have some really good um, areas covered both for the concepts and for the implementation. So. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, Richard. Sure. So um, I, I echo uh, Hannah and John's and Dave's comments about some of the about uh, maybe some repopulating of the expertise of this uh, stakeholder group and and I think that collapsing it so that there is um, think of it as a tree structure rather than everybody having to be at the table simultaneously, but that they have that they have branches underneath them to other further expertise for them to reach into um, can help facilitate that approach. Um, and I do, so I, I, I will disclose that I am working with AECOM right now on the Delta, Delta ADAPTS, which is the, um, for the Delta Stewardship Commission, looking at uh, climate vulnerability and adaptation strategies in the, uh, in the Delta. Um, so I, I'm fairly familiar with what resources they have in this area. And one of the areas that I'm actually supplying services to them is on social, social sciences and economics. So they do have some of that work in-house, but they're not, that's not one of the things that's in their roster. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I think that, and that's one of the things that is, I feel like is missing from this list in the uh, TAC group, um, as people have pointed out for developing incentives and implementation issues and I think, uh, and financing questions uh, because th this was, that was one of the things that was missing in the Menlo Park cap that we were looking at was, where do you actually get $12 million to pay for the program ideas that they had? Um, they really overlooked that part. So, um, uh, I, that, I guess that's just sort of my, my general and, and more specific comments um, uh, in this topic area. I think one thing I will note, it's, I think it's nice that we have Energia on the team. Ezra Beeman is, you know, ran for the city council. So he's aware of city council or city issues. I know Ezra from other work since we work in similar areas. Um, so, and I think he's a good addition. So. Um, and then, of course, Farron Piers knows all of our, has done everything on traffic in our town, I guess. <laughs> so um, I think it's a strong team. There's just a, a few gaps, and and I think that there, there's a ways we can rearrange the TAC group to fill that. Okay, anyone else have thoughts they want to share for the moment? Um, yeah, I think, uh, so first of all, I think that this is a really uh, comprehensive and impressive plan. Um, in terms of community engagement, I think that reaching out to perhaps the Davis uh, Center for Community and Citizen Science could be really helpful in figuring out how we should be engaging residents. I know that they have a lot of staff that have worked on kind of these outreach science projects, at least at the Arboretum and other kind of natural areas. So that could be an area of help, I think. Can you send us a um, contact person for that, Kira? Yes, I will send you one. Okay. okay anyone else? Uh, Tom has his hand raised. Yes, uh, I know you're not saying who you're inviting to be on TAC, but uh, there is a uh, person on campus, uh, Arnold Bloom, who's written a book on climate change. He teaches an online course on climate change and has been a member of a National Science Foundation Commission on climate change. And he's uh, probably one of the um, most expert experts on the topic on, at UC Davis. Great. Again, like I said, the, this kind of um, input is exactly what we're looking for right now. We may or may not be able to respond to all of these suggestions, but if you can send me links or specific contacts for these people, we will, we will consider that and try to come up with a technical advisory committee that is 
very representative of the various topic areas that we want from a, um, a professional and technical expertise point of view that will support um, what we're doing with the community outreach and the internal team components of the project. And just to be sure that you are aware, um, presentations and input from the NRC are not limited to a quarterly basis. We don't want to overwhelm the NRC with um, information about the climate action and adaptation plan, but we do want to make sure to come to you as appropriate to get your input because we know that you are the main advisory body and we appreciate your input. And there are other commissions that have equal have also very important um, roles. Um, and so we wanna make sure that both staff and commissions are represented and given the specific opportunity to provide input. So don't worry that you're not going to have enough time to know what's going on. It's just that quarterly seemed like a good target and we can do more um, when necessary and not that frequently if there's nothing to report. Meg, I see you've got your hand raised too. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree with the comments that have been made already. And I also understand the logic of the kind of three pronged approach. And I just wanted to highlight the, I think the reason it's so important to make sure that there is still community and um, equity representation, at least so, in a small amount in the technical advisory committee is because I feel like often when these two subjects are kind of approached separately, um, often there might be a technical reason that an equity focused solution might not work as well. And then on the other hand, I think often if the conversations are all around among technical people, there are kind of practical social implications that they might be overlooking. So I just wanted to highlight the importance of that but overall this seems like a good plan and I'm really excited to see how it evolves. And Michelle, go ahead. I, I want to uh, uh, echo also everything everybody's been saying about the equity. I also just wanted to point out that there are at least two specifically equity centered uh, groups that are on the stakeholder group list there, the Center for Regional Change and uh, resilient YOLO. So it's not missing per se, but um, I definitely also agree with everybody that I wanna see it throughout. And uh, the one uh, commenter who mentioned Oakland's plan, there's definitely some um, uh, good input that could be probably placed towards this plan. Maybe we should all consider reviewing what, what they've got in order to sort of um, take a look at the plan that gets submitted to us uh, from that lens um, since it's already been done and why reinvent the wheel. Thanks. Okay, maybe we'll go ahead and wrap this item. We've gone a little bit over, not too bad. Um, so thanks, Diana, for joining. Thanks, Carrie, for shepherding the whole thing. Um, and let's, again, like, follow up. So if, if you do have the specific ideas in mind, we're really good in the NRC at giving suggestions and not always so good at following through and helping. So <laughs> um, if you come up with specific names, if you have them at top of mind, or if you have some time to do a little bit of research to cover areas that you care about, uh, put your money where your mouth is. Okay. Just, uh, just as a final comment, yeah. I wanted to thank um, Michelle for her comments about those groups that we considered as being really important for equity along with some individuals within other groups like Valley Vision um, or the Center for, um, or the um, Climate um, Readiness Collaborative of the Capital Region that you know, are really broad based. Um, so I think we've tried to make that work, but again, your suggestions are welcome. And I know you wanna move on, Hannah, but I just wanna give mm -hmm. um, Diana a chance to have any wrap up comments or thoughts if, if you have any, Diana. Um, no, I just want to say thanks to everybody for your, your thoughts. And we are really excited about this plan and getting it started. And um, any further thoughts are welcome. So thank you very much.
We are too. We're kind of like my mother. We're excellent at bringing you down and pointing out your shortcomings when you feel like you're doing a really good job. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So let's transition now to item 6C. Uh, 6C. Is that what we're doing? 6, no, 6B. 6B, yeah. I was thinking we can't talk about our goals before we've oriented our commissioners. Anyway, well, we know we're on item 6B. <laughs> um, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, new commissioner orientation. So we have a PowerPoint, um, but I thought that for this item, um, I would start by, by talking through, you know, and, how I see the NRC functioning um, because the PowerPoint gets a little bit more into specific subject areas. So I'll kind of give an overview of how I um, personally as a member of the NRC as well as as the feel like the commission has functioned as well as in my role as chair where I would like the to see the commission continue to go. Um, and then I'll give an opportunity for anybody who's been on the commission before to chime in with stuff that I miss. Um, and then we can talk about process a little bit, and then we can um, review some of the major topic areas that the NRC covers and things that we've worked on in the past to kind of give you a sense of our portfolio and end with that because that will also be a nice segue into our item 6C, which will be a goal setting planning exercise. Um, I think just to kind of knock it out of the way, we'll open public comment on this item at the beginning. I know we've lost some of our participants. Do we have any public comment on this item? Okay, so we'll close public comment. Um, okay, and so my intro is basically like the biggest thing to remember about the NRC is that we're an advisory body, right? So we don't have any specific, I mean, there's a couple of commissions that all, all the commissions are advisory commissions, all city commissions are advisory bodies, but there are a couple that have specific tasks, like for instance, the tree commission receives um, requests to remove trees and they have to approve those requests or otherwise those tree removals can't get done. Um, and similarly, like the planning commission has to okay stuff before certain planning projects can go forward. The NRC doesn't, doesn't really have that role in any sort of a routine capacity. Um, sometimes certain projects, um, like the council requires certain projects or staff to consult with the NRC before they permit them to move to the next stage. But as a matter of course, there's not like routine items that we check off of our list every time we meet or every periodic time that we meet. Um, and which is sometimes frustrating because it, it can mean that we don't have as much of a sense of purpose as some of those other commissions, but it also means that we have a pretty wide purview to pursue things that are of interest to us and things that are salient to the Davis community. Um, so I think of that advisory capacity as it's, it's sometimes more of a responsive capacity and sometimes more of a proactive capacity. Um, on the responsive side of things, even though we don't have topics or tasks that we routinely visit, um, we do frequently get asked to provide input on stuff that's going on. It, it doesn't typically happen that our any of the council members or council liaisons come directly to us and say, hey, we're deliberating over this thing. And so what are your thoughts on it? But it often happens that council, again, directs staff or um, directs potentially developers to bring a project, to bring a proposal before the NRC and get the NRC's input as part of their decision-making process. Um, there are also routine presentations that we get. So we get routine updates on the city's solid waste program, on the city's integrated pest management strategy, on the city's water use, water conservation, um, a handful of other topics like that. So things do sometimes come before us and they get put on the agenda and we have the opportunity. That was so somewhat what happened with the cap, right? 
um, that it was were the primary advisory body on the cap. So that came before us. We digest that information and draw on our expertise or where appropriate tap into our networks um, that we have access to and get their input and bring that all back. Um, so that's a bit more of the, the passive responsive NRC role. And then there's the more proactive role, um, which you know sometimes means it gets a little fuzzier, right? Because again, we are not a policy making policy setting body, we are, we are an advisory body. Um, but that said, you know, the council can only have their ears open to so many things and hear so many people and digest so many topics. Um, and so we provide a filtering mechanism for that. So some of that comes again, just sort of gets handed to you at public comment. People come and they get public comment about things that they think are important, or they send the NRC an email about things that they think are important. And over time, you can get a sense of what issues are bubbling to the top and um, try and bring those to the attention of council. We have a couple of different mechanisms for doing that. We can either reach directly out to our council liaisons in sort of an informal capacity. We can prepare a memo and transmit that memo to all of council um, or to our council liaisons to then transmit to council on our behalf. So that's a bit more of a formal avenue. Um, we also frequently adopt, oh, Carrie, are they called resolutions? I never really know what they're called when we say no. a thing. Council does resolutions, we do recommendations. We do recommendations, yes. It's the ca constantly screwing up commission and committee and recommendation and resolution, but Carrie will always tell me when I'm wrong. Um, so we do sometimes um, come up with a formal recommendation and that we can vote on and then that gets transmitted. Um, to council. So there is sort of that that filtering element of just being aware of what's coming up with the things that get delivered to us. And then there's also the kind of going out into the community and paying attention to what's going on. We have a lot of different people on the NRC now and who have been on the NRC in the past who participate in other community groups, who sit in on other meetings and bring that info to us and just sort of help us as a collective body get a sense of what's going on in the community, what's going on in the region and how things are, are fitting together. Um, and, oh, and then I had sort of, oh, and then, and then the last more proactive thing that we can do is we sometimes have things that we specifically care about and try and pursue a specific um, policy action that we might recommend to council. So a couple of recent examples. One is the uh, whole leaf blower ordinance, right? So there'd been a lot of um, beginning public input for a long time that leaf blowers were a nuisance for noise reasons, for air quality impacts, especially during wildfire season. And so that wasn't something that um, came, it came there was sort of the public component that came to us, but it wasn't as if staff had come up with a leaf blower proposal that we reacted to. We as a commission decided that given our own personal interests in the climate impacts of leaf blowers, the air quality impacts of leaf blowers, and in light of the substantial public comment that we were getting about the adverse impacts of leaf blowers, that we wanted to be active and do something about that. So we put together a report about the impacts of leaf blowers with some policy options, presented that to council. And now we are in the process of working with staff on developing a more permanent leaf blower ordinance to um, replace the temporary leaf blower ban that was enacted in the fall. Um, we've also had folks before my time, um, the NRC was, quite active as I understand it in helping the city get its plastic ban, plastic bag ban into effect. But that was something that was more like, okay, we want to do this. What needs to happen? What are the steps? We can't take it so far as putting that ordinance or putting a law into effect, but we could see what research, do the legwork to research what other communities have done, draft some policy options and put that in front of the staff or council makers, council members who have that decision-making authority. Um, so in some, 
I would say NRC overall advisory body, we can be responsive or we can be proactive. Um, the responsive stuff, you don't have to, you have to sometimes read a lot of things that come to you on very short notice, but it just comes to you. And then the proactive stuff is the paying attention to what's going on at public comment, paying attention to what's going on in the community and thinking about what you individually care about and what um, needs to be done to make a difference on a particular topic. Um, so that's how I see the NRC functioning. Let me stop and see if my other veteran commissioners want to add to that overview. I don't want to add, um, but I, I, I think you covered everything there. If, um, maybe, maybe if I could summarize it just a bit though, um, you, you covered really well our, our own initiatives. You mentioned that the leaf blower, the cool, the cool parking lot, things that we would like to, see, we think that the city should do, we initiate, we respond to kind of routine and you'll see this, no, you just missed it. We respond to routine annual reports, water conservation, solid waste, et cetera. Uh, and, and then um, staff will come and they'll have specific things they'll ask us to help them, you know, um, um, get 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 uh, input on ongoing in an, in a uh, you know, project specific kinds of pro of issues such as I just want to give some examples which helps illustrate uh, the organics facility study the water uh, recycling and reclamation study uh, the reach code that we just did uh, with uh, Greg Mahoney um, these were specific initiatives from staff they would they might come to us and and uh, you know, touch base periodically as we move toward uh, conclusions of those decisions. So we can routine, routine uh, feedback and then project specific feedback. And in the past, we've also done CEQA uh, reviews as well. Yeah, and in a sec, I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint that has a more detail about Again, the topic areas that we tend to get most involved in and some stuff that we've done in the past. But I wanted to start with the overview because once you've got the thing on your screen, you only pay attention to the thing on your screen. Um, yeah. I was just gonna, I will add a little bit more about that. Uh, the NRC had even a broader um, charge until about six years ago of actually overseeing the utility rates review as well. Um, and that's been handed off to the Utilities Commission. So there's some interaction that happens with the Utilities Commission. And there's also interaction that happens with other commissions as well. Uh, the tree and open space, trees and open space are two that, um, that immediately come to mind and the bicycle transportation and safety. I can't remember what that acronym all stands for. Um, that, uh, so, so there is interaction between commissions as well. So it's important not to think narrowly about our charge, but actually to think about mm -hmm. how does this affect other, other spheres that are being over watched by other, other commissions as well. Gloria, did you want to add anything to our little um, overview? I am muted. Um, <laughs> no, I think that you did a very good job of uh, summarizing there. And um, I, you mentioned something about, you know, the purpose not being uh, so clear or important or something like that. And I would have to um, disagree with that. I think that the purpose of this commission is is very important and is, has done a lot of things to further, um, you know, the the goals of the city and the city is goals are, uh, you know, the our identity I think is is uh, pretty much wrapped up in in a lot of the things that this commission does. So um, I um, think you guys do a great job. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Um, to clarify, I don't, I don't, I certainly think we're important. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think we were important. I said, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think that what we do is um, necessarily as specific 
as what as what some of the other commissions do. Narrow, yeah. Um, okay, and so then I want to touch a little bit on a couple of major process points that come up all the time, um, and they'll continue to come up. We'll bring them up in the PowerPoint a little bit, um, but it's the it, it's related mostly to like the whole the Brown Act and how that affects how we're structured and how we function and how we can communicate and make decisions. So you all have received that. Um, commissioner handbook and you haven't done brown act training yet but you will is that right carrie yes that's correct yeah okay um but in Don't essence worry. one of us one of us or me will always let people know <laughs> well, yeah so so i mean the 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 goal of the Brown Act is to ensure that all decision making by an advisory body like the NRC happens in the public view. Um, so it's a noble goal and it can sometimes get in the way of good intentions. Um, but what that means is that um, it, it constrains the extent to which we as commissioners are able to interact outside of publicly noticed meetings. Um, so we have our we have our publicly noticed meetings. You're at one. Congratulations. Um, we can also schedule special meetings. So we are not constrained to once monthly meetings if there's a need to talk about something as a group sooner than every month. We can do that. It's just that that meeting has to be publicly noticed and the agenda for a special meeting has to be published. Um, I don't think it's three business days in advance or some, it's not three, 72 hours in advance. I believe for a special meeting, it's only 24 hours. Yeah, um, but it still has to be published in, in advance. Um, we can also send materials to each other as a group. So you saw I did that, um, I sent like the, um, some of those planning documents to the NRC email, uh, which also, which goes to all the different members of the NRC, as well as to our council liaisons, as well as to a couple of members of city staff. It's also okay to send attachments um, to the entire NRC. If you wanna keep it just to the NRC, that's fine, but it has to be the entire NRC and you have to CC carry. Um, it can't just be to a subset. You can also send it to Carrie if you have something to share. You can send that to Carrie, and Carrie can then distribute it. What you can't do is once you receive something in your inbox, you can't have an um, an iterative conversation. So you can just sort of like get it, you have it, but you can't then respond to it with additional thoughts. Um, we also can't use any kind of collaborative workspace like um, Google Docs because then that's something where a work product is being created by a critical mass of commission members outside of the public view. Um, to, you know, we sort of recognize that work does need to be done outside of commission meetings. And so to do that, we can form subcommittees um, and subcommittees can consist of, it has to consist of less than a majority of the commission. So it can be two or three people who we as a commission agree at a regular meeting are gonna work together on a specific thing. And then subcommittees are welcome to get together as a group, although you know, perhaps not in COVID times, but now get together as a virtual group um, and to exchange emails, that's all fine, but you have to then stay on the topic of your subcommittee and you can't just decide outside of a commission that you're going to be a subcommittee. A subcommittee has to be formally established in the public eye. Um, that doesn't, none of this precludes a group of commissioners being together at something. You can get together at a social function if there's some kind of meeting that's open to the public. You know, more than three commission members may be at that public event or public meeting. It's just the you can't be talking about commission business or working on commission stuff outside of a commission meeting unless you're a subcommittee. Um, that's the biggest process hurdle we run into. Um, so I wanted to touch on that. So now let me first turn it over to Carrie to see if I said anything wrong. 
and then I'm going to open it up for questions and then I'm going to go to the PowerPoint where we'll do more of that kind of like subject matter, get a little bit more into the details. So Carrie, what did I do wrong? Nothing. Hannah, oh, you excellent. Did it. Fantastic. Yeah, no, you, I think that that was really helpful for the commissioners and um, a very good overview of how this whole system works. Um, one small point of clarification, when you do send something to the NRC link, the email link, it goes to all eight commissioners and me and the city manager's office and perhaps a few other people I'm not completely sure, but just be aware that that is not just only commissioners and an email like what Hannah sent with the work plan information, that information had all already been posted before. It was publicly available information. So um, that could have been linked to the materials packet, but it was easier for Hannah to kind of send the most recent version of what she, what she had and wanted you to take a look at. So, you know, we all make mistakes sometimes, but we do our best to follow the Brown Act rules. And they are, as Hannah said, for very good intentions and sometimes they're really annoying. So I think this the summary Hannah gave was excellent. Thank you, Hannah. Cool, fantastic. Okay, I've learned something over two years. Um okay, so now let's let's do questions and then we'll we'll do the presentation. Then you can ask more questions <laughs> after the presentation. I give you the hand clap emoji, but it's not available on this Zoom. Oh, uh, that's okay. You could raise your hand and that would be a little bit like you asked a question. It would be kind of, kind of looks like a raised hand and kind of looks like a high five. Um, okay, Tom, it looks like you have a question. Yeah, so Hannah, let's, just to clarify for me, uh, let's say I run into you at Starbucks. Yeah. And uh, I say, hi, Hannah, how you doing? Uh, what yeah. about this thing at the commission that's absolutely not allowed? Um, what about this thing at the commission? I mean, you could say like, boy, that was a crazy commission meeting that we had last night. Um, you know, you can you can sort of like reference, we don't have to pretend that we don't know each other. We just can't do any, any active work. Okay. And you're certainly welcome to buy me a coffee. Okay. <laughs> and if I wanted to ask you that same question, but I sent it by email, but included the entire commission, that would be okay. Um, like, give me an example of a question that you might ask. Well, a clarification on something that we talked about at the meeting. Um, yeah, typically, typically it would be better for you to ask Carrie um, for that okay. rather than rather than asking me. Um, and she, she, if it was a point of clarification, just something that went on, she would probably be able to answer that. And if not, then she could direct it to, she could make the decision of whether it sort of you know, needed to be answered then and what would be the best avenue for getting that answer. Okay. Yeah, try, to, so, try, to think of it, try to think of it along two lines. One is avoiding work product or discussion outside of public meetings. So that's a little bit what you're referring to. And the second thing is to make sure that all communications among commissioners are recorded so that if there was, for example, a Public Information Act request about some topic, there had not been a lot of side conversations about a particular topic by commissioners. So th those are a little bit the two streams that you're trying to be aware of and avoid going in the wrong direction with. Um, so probably safest to as Hannah said, direct questions through your staff liaison and um, to discuss topics of concern to the uh, commission at public meetings. So I have to jump in and say, this is a radical new interpretation of the Brown Act because we've always up to this point been allowed to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with other commissioners, as long as we didn't have a chain communication and that we understood that we were talking within a group that was a much smaller, was smaller than the quorum of the commission. That, that this is really radically new. That no, you're, I, what, 
it, Richard, no, it I, is. It is, Carrie. It is definitely new. <laughs> let me let me clarify. If there is a subcommittee of three people. No, this is no. Are, as private citizens, we have been allowed to talk to each other. Wait, Richard, permission. Richard, this, let, 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 let Carrie respond to it. Okay. okay. Um, I think you have to use your best judgment. I, I don't think that anybody is telling you that you are constrained from having conversations, but please be aware that as a commissioner, you do have certain constraints and boundaries on mm -hmm. your conversations. And we do often have subcommittees, which may be up to three people. Um, if it goes to a fourth commissioner, that's a problem. So nobody, I, I really think it's it's understanding the framework and using your common sense. Right, but I mean, like the CCA conversation, the, the, the thing that led to the Valley Clean Energy started as a conversation among commissioners on the Utilities Commission. That, you know, a small group of us, a subgroup that was not part of a subcommittee, that was just a private conversation. And that was an example of a policy initiative that actually started without any formal uh, initiation from being uh, created um, within the, a commission meeting, um, just standard conversation. And th that's just one of many examples of that sort of thing. So, you know, there is, I'm sure that Gloria at, it, it talks to city council members about city policy one-on-one -on -one outside of city council meetings and outside of subcommittee meetings. So um, I was, and I would I hope she actually, does. I was actually going to jump in and uh, comment on this. Uh, so, you know, if there is something that is a policy that is going to be discussed or that is on our, uh, you know, on our radar for discussion, um, you know, if it's on the agenda, it's coming up, then we form uh, Brown Act Buddies. And so mm -hmm. then that that's like two people that can talk about, you know, that one particular item, mm -hmm. but then we, we are prohibited from talking to anyone else. You know, you know, if I, uh, for instance, Josh and I are on a subcommittee about Pacifico. So we talk about, um, you know, things that have to do with Pacifico, or we talk to neighbors about Pacifico but I won't discuss Pacifico with any of the other council members so that it's only two. Uh, because, you know, when you talk to other people, you get into, it's, it's hard to, um, then that person will talk to another commissioner and another commissioner, and now you've got a chain. Right. And so that, and so now you've got a violation of the Brown Act. Um, so if you, you know, can make an agreement to say, look, I'm not going to talk to anyone else except for this one person. Um, but it's really easy, especially on a, a bigger body like this to, you know, to have a, a chain of, of people talking to each other. And now you're having a, a whole meeting that is not in the public realm you know, that's not being done publicly. Yeah. And, and then and as, as far as, um, you know, the, the example you gave about Valley Clean Energy, are you saying that commissioners put that together outside? And, and I don't know if that was like, that was not something that was on your agenda or something that, you know, you were, you were coming up, you know, that, that was going to come before the NRC uh, or that the NRC was working on. I don't, I, I'd have to get some clarification or, around that, um, you know, because I can right. imagine having right. coffee with somebody somewhere and a good idea pops up and you go, oh, wow, you know, that's, that is a, that is a really good idea. And you, there has to be a mechanism for moving that good idea forward, right? Right, and I agree, and a, and a couple of things. One, I, I, I do explicitly set up Brown Act buddies when I talk or whatever, you know, I make, make sure that we're all on the same page that way. But, you know, you, you raise a good point in that um, I honestly don't remember too often having discussions with anybody 
about an, an item that was already on the agenda. So like the Valley Clean Energy item was Jerry Braun and Lorenzo Christoph and I were on the Utilities Commission or the Utility Rates Commission as it was known then. And, and we talked about this together while we, as we were commissioners and put to forward that proposal for pursuing a, at the time a Davis CCA and, and it evolved into the Valley Clean Energy. But it wasn't, when we were talking about it, it was not yet on the agenda. It was something that we brought to the commission and brought to the city well, brought to the commission basically, and then eventually to the city council about that. And um, other than other than our, I think that once it was on the agenda, we were a subcommittee on that. So I think that yeah, you're probably right in terms of focusing on focusing it that those kinds of rules on agendized items is is probably the appropriate way of approaching that. Which doesn't mean that you can't talk to commissioners about policy issues. That are that might come before the NRC, or that you would like to make come before the NRC prior to them being on the agenda. Um, but even right. then, you have to be you have to worry about making sure you're not doing a sequence, right? Right. right. To, prior right. To, prior to that, a serial link that you need to keep your group small, small enough, three yeah. or smaller. Yeah. yeah. So I think I and I think that that is what Carrie was was you know trying to get at is that. It, it can get, it, you know, you can sort of um, wade into that uh, trouble spot pretty easily unless, um, you know, you're, you, you know, just really careful about it. And, and I will always kind of check with the city manager's office um, and go, hey, you know, is this, is this okay to talk about? Or, you know, mm -hmm. um, just always kind of check in and make sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key point, Gloria, is that you need to be a little more cautious as a commissioner. You're a representative of a commission of the city of Davis, and you do have some um, protocol constraints. But if you have any questions, just ask me and I can forward those questions to the city man to the city clerk's office, or I can, you know, answer them based on what I know. But um, this is not meant to muzzle anyone. It is meant to make sure that these discussions happen in the public realm. And um, I know it's, it's something that many commissioners and to some extent other representatives of local government, you know, it's not always, it, it, it can sometimes be difficult, but it's not, it's not hard to do. It's just, you have to be cautious. And um, you've taken on a role that represents your community. And so that's the upside of it. The downside is you have to be careful. Right. Okay. Well, the Brown Act and frustration over it comes up frequently. So this <laughs> won't, won't be the last end that we talk about it. And um, other questions quick right now, and then I'm going to go into the presentation and just run through that and then we can do a little bit more questions. Hannah, would you say that we have some sort of Brown Act conversation at almost every single NRC meeting? I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> it's he's kind of like Brown is kind of like our ninth commissioner. The one that we just can't kick off. Um, okay. Let me go ahead and pull up the presentation. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because you guys all have it um, have it as part of your um, packet. So you, let's see. Well, we'll just kind of click through it because it might spark questions or hilarious quips from myself. Um, OK, so you guys can all see my screen, right? Good. Um, okay, so here's the NRC charge. There's, I will say with the charge, um, early in when I joined the commission, we kind of went back to this charge and thought about trying to revisit it because there's a couple of things that we wanted to make a little bit more, just change the wording a little bit and a couple of topics that we wanted to add. And it turned out it was the whole process to change the charge. and. So this is kind of good enough. 
um, the, I would say, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't feel like you're entirely constrained by the bulleted list or that these are the things that we focus on absolutely the most, but really the charge is advise the city council on the preservation management and enhancement of the city's natural resources. That's the overall mandate. Um, and so stick with that and we're pretty good. Um, so we just did some talking about commission procedures. Again, if you haven't had the opportunity yet to really go through and read the commissioner handbook, please do that. Um, think like some of most of this other stuff, the Brown Act and Rosenberg's rules, I think are both covered in that handbook. Um, and periodically I do go back and refer to the handbook just to see you, you figure out things after you've been on the commission for a little bit. Some of the things that are in the handbook make a little bit more sense. Um, you already did the, oh, the office. Some, was somebody about to say something? Yeah, Hannah, that was me. Um, if I could make a couple quick comments, you may have yeah. just about to address this. Um, the handbook actually is updated in um, 2020. So that's mm. um, not accurate. Uh, and all the new commissioners have received it. If there are existing commissioners that have not received the 2020 update, I will be sure to send them to you. And um, uh, the last two bullets, Hannah, were you going to address those? If yes. Not, address attendance. Thank you. Yes, but but maybe, but no, but maybe I want you to address them. Um, like you said, most the first four bullets have been have been addressed. Um, attendance. Um, we do keep attendance, and there is a requirement, um, as stated in the handbook. I may not have the exact language, but you need to attend. Um, at least three quarters of the meetings. And if you miss a number of meetings in a row, we might need to have a conversation, you and I, you and each commissioner, each commissioner and I may need to have a conversation about um, why, if, is there something we can do to help with, um, with attendance? But when you sign on to be a commissioner, you're saying, yes, I will dedicate my fourth Mondays to commission business. And communications and ethics, really, that's about the training that is coming up. So that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Because this looks like the right place. We, okay. we received the, um, uh, um, the little maps, but there wasn't much. We haven't gotten those in the past, and there wasn't much explanation about what we were supposed to do with them. Yeah, thanks for asking that, John. Um, those are maps that are provided to show the 500 foot radius from your personal residence that shows if there is a development project um, or other topic of interest that comes up within 500 foot radius of your residence, then you are in a con conflict zone for that. Um, it's not, as you'll see when you do the, um, the webinar, it's not like clearly and always 500 feet. Sometimes it's a thousand feet, sometimes it's something different, but those were, um, uh, there was a comment at the staff training that said that those conflict zone maps are available for commissioners. And I requested them for the NRC. And one, as soon as I received them, I sent them out to you. So most of you won't have projects within your area of conflict, but you could possibly. So we'll talk more about if you need to step out of the room or just not participate in a, in a conversation. But I think that it's a really great tool for each of us to have to know the reason for having them is because you are on an advisory body. And so you had conversations about projects within that zone and you just need to know if you are in an area of conflict. Okay. Did that answer your question? I think so. It's the 500 foot di uh, radius around your home that was identified in that area. And I should have perhaps sent it after this meeting instead of before, but I just sent them out as soon as I got them. 
right? And also, Gloria, I appreciate your cat. I have my dog right here. Um, okay. So recurring protocols and activities. Um, so this is some of this we touched on before when we did our commission overview. So even though we don't have duties that we have to fulfill along, like in the same way as commissions like the tree commission and the planning commission do, we do have things that come up periodically. The environmental recognition awards we will be talking about a little bit later. Um, John mentioned that we frequently get involved with um, CEQA review, so new major developments. Again, we're not a uh, mandated part of the planning process. Things don't have to get our sign off, but we do frequently review the environmental impacts of major developments. We receive and review annual reports on um, different elements of the city's natural resources. We talked about that before. Um, we periodically revisit our work plan and goals. Again, we'll be doing that today. And we have a long range calendar where we can keep track of stuff that's coming up for future meetings, as well as things that we have on the back burner that we haven't um, set a date for discussion yet. Um, we talked about this. Um, we want to take a broad view of our uh, role in the city government, as well as just sort of in the community, generally speaking. So we do want to coordinate with other commissions. Um, you're, of course, welcome to go and sit in on any commission meeting that you would like. It's especially easy and nowadays. You just open up your laptop. While you've watched everything on Netflix, you can just watch commission meetings. It's a constantly refreshing source of content. Um, Michelle, do you have a question? Yeah, that, I have a question about that one. I'm yes. curious sort of how that works about coordinating with other commissions. Maybe you're going to. Yes, uh, go yes, over. that's that's a good question, Michelle. And and, <laughs> and one, um, so uh, I feel like this this committee in particular. Yes, really like should be coordinating with almost all of the other committees. <laughs> yes, and it is it is challenging. I mean, the the easiest thing that you can do then and one that raises no questions is that um, if there is an agenda item that you're interested in um, on another commission's agenda or you're just sort of generally interested to see what they're talking about you can go and listen in on a commission meeting that's no no problem at all any number of commissioners could go listen in on another commission's meeting when it comes to like doing some sort of work group or task group Carrie, now I have to come back to you on that front because I, I am still confused about where we are about, well, let me, let me actually tell you what I do now. Um, another thing that can happen is that you can schedule, you can send a liaison to another commission's meeting. So if there's an agenda item that's coming up at another commission, let's say like the NRC has talked about some development now the um, utilities commission is going to talk about that same development in a week and we have something that we'd like them to consider. We can deputize a commission member to go be part of that, um, to be our liaison over to that other commission for a time. And we can also schedule a joint meeting of commissions, like a publicly noticed joint meeting where I get fuzzy is about whether we're able to establish any kind of like cross commission subcommittee, AKA two by twos. Um, and I might I think, just, I think I that the best answer, sorry. I think the best answer to that is to address it as it comes up, but the, but the general answer is Two by twos between commissions are not allowed. Um, large joint commissions can be arranged through the city manager's office and city clerk. Um, assigning specific commissioners the right to speak for the full commission at other commission meetings is allowed. So the, that that's kind of the the framework that we can use. But um, having 
two people from the Tree Commission and two people from the NRC to create a subcommittee that does not work. And so we, we can get into more detail on that yeah. um, when those types of things come up. Yeah, it is, it is tricky. And I think it's, it's one of those areas where, um, you know, it's, it's helpful to just kind of be a member of the community. Like it's okay to do basically like what Richard was talking about before to know who's on the other commissions and to chat with them generally about stuff that's going on. Like that's all fine. It's just that you can't sit down with another, what gets tricky is when you're trying to sit down with a couple of members from another commission and hammer out like a written document. Um, but doing kind of like informal coordination of like figuring out what's going on so that you can set up a formal process, that's all okay. Okay, yeah, that yeah. was one of my, my questions. Um, yeah, about talking to other people and other commissions about yeah. sort of what they're mm -hmm. doing around maybe a mm -hmm. similar topic or- Yeah, it's just, you know, keep it at just sort of the later. pretty like <laughs> macro level, yeah. You can speak with other commissioners from other commissions. That is okay. You just can't create a formal subcommittee body with yeah. other commissions. Okay. And 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 I do, you know, periodically you know, shoot an email over to like a chair of another commission to kind of find out like when something might be getting on their agenda so we can plan in that purpose. Yeah. Right. Anna, and, there is, and, and there are nuances, but that's that's the general overview is that you're not limited to speak to other people from other commissioners. The the caveat would be if you spoke to four people from some other commission, then that's a problem. Or if four of the NRC members spoke to one person from another commission, that's a problem. But generally, you are allowed to speak to other commissioners about what they're up to. You just can't speak on behalf of the NRC, nor can you create some sort of a body to address issues, either as a two by two or a three by three or some other formation. Thanks. Go ahead, John. I was going to point out there's just one exception in that we designate a um, representative to the Unitrans Advisory Committee. And that person is a full functioning member of that, of that committee. Yes, that is true. That's actually in the charter of the Unitrans Advisory Commission Committee is that an NRC member would represent the NRC on that committee. Um, that would be similar to, in the past, the NRC has appointed one commissioner from the NRC to go to another commission, such as the Utilities Commission, to speak either generally or on a specific topic that that commission is addressing. And that's okay. You can appoint one commissioner to represent the whole commission at another commission. So again, I mean, it gets into nuance. It's um, not necessary to figure all of this out now. We can figure it out on a case by case basis, but I think this gives you a sort of sense of what's okay and what's not. Okay. So let's carry on with this. Um, I don't think anything much more needs to be said on this slide that you can't read for yourself. Um, agenda planning, I mentioned the long range calendar. We typically touch back in on the long range calendar at the end of every meeting. Um, Carrie, myself and John, who right now is serving as uh, vice chair, we work together a couple of weeks before every meeting to figure out how our agenda is gonna look. So when that agenda shows up in um, in your inboxes, we've put some thought into that. So that said, if you have something that you would like to be added to an agenda, um, it's helpful. We usually put together 
we start talking about the agenda typically two weeks out um, from our next meeting, but then we finalize the agenda the week of. So if you're able to get us ideas or, or um, suggestions of something that you want added to the agenda, the ideal way to do it is to bring it up at a commission meeting um, and have it get on the long range calendar because that's what we're working from. But if something comes up in the interim, um, then you can email either the full commission or you can email the three of us to suggest an agenda topic and then we'll we'll decide whether or not to agendize that at our discretion. Um, okay. So NRC activities, we pretty much covered all of this. We talked about the subcommittee structure and about how we can stand up subcommittees to do specific things. Um, and we'll, right now our subcommittee structure is, is pretty sparse and that's intentional because we wanted you all to have input into what subcommittees we form. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, okay, and then the rest of the slide deck, I really am going to click through pretty quickly um, because you have it all, you can read it. Um, but we've previously organized ourselves somewhat around these six topic areas, water, solid waste, hazardous material, air quality, energy, climate change, slash sustainability somewhat broadly. Um, water, We've looked at water quantity as well as water quality. Um, we looked at the reclaimed water study. We frequently, sorry, not, I shouldn't say frequently, we periodically get an update on the city's water consumption and water conservation efforts. Um, we've talked quite a bit about gray water use and reuse. Um, there was recently a gray water ordinance that went into effect that we provided some input on. Um, I think there's more that we could be doing with gray water. Um, so, so that's a, a topic that's front of mind that's certainly not done. Um, solid waste, we also get the annual solid waste report. Um, we recently have been talking about um, uh, sustainability food recommendations. Um, a big area in solid waste is the implementation of SB 1383 and how Davis is going to uh, meet the state mandates in that bill related to waste reduction. Um, talked about some of this. Again, we're going to click pretty quickly through it, but if there is anything that you want to know more about, you can reach out. New commissioners are welcome to reach out to any, um, to carry or to any, any of the existing commissioners later on. Uh, or stop me if you see something that you really care about. Um, IPM, we get an IPM report. Um, we get an IPM report and we get a hazardous materials report. Um, we haven't done an enormous amount on, on this front recently. Uh, air quality, we did quite a bit of on wood smoke, um, specifically on, on uh, residential wood smoke in 2019, and we re-upped that in fall of 2020. Um, leaf blowers and the leaf blower ordinance, like we touched on before, is a very active area for us. Um, and I think that following this past year's wildfire season, figuring out a more coordinated wildfire smoke response and education is something that perhaps should rise higher up on our priority list. And okay. energy, all the energy things, I can't think of a single energy thing that we don't care about. Um, there's always, there's definitely more to do, especially um, now that the cap is rolling. Um, energy is not my main area, so I usually listen happily in while other people take charge, but, but I advocate for clean energy, I'm a fan. Um, and a really great accomplishment of last year, which, which we can't put um, you know, chalk up entirely to the NRC. Certainly there was much staff effort that went into it, but um, the development of this uh, residential, non-residential reach code to encourage 
greater energy efficiency and greater ambition on that front in the city um, was has been a really great accomplishment of recent. Um, cap. It's going to be, we're going to see the cap a whole lot this year. Um, and we are constantly reminding city council that they passed a climate emergency resolution as if, as if they could forget. Um, but, but we constantly send them a memo saying that you passed a climate emergency resolution and we'd like you to do yet more about it. Um, this, is, this is again where we fulfill our Jewish mother um, role where we overlook everything that the city is doing that we like about climate emergency resolution and we point to all the ways that they could do more. Um, and many things fall under, of course, the climate change front, climate change and sustainability broadly. And that kind of takes us to the end of our topic overview. So let's kind of open it up a little bit and then, then we'll be done orientating and then we can talk a little bit about planning. Questions, comments from other current commissioners? Anything else? Good job. Okay, fantastic. Well, let's keep chugging right along then. Um, okay, so now we're gonna transition to our item six. Now we're on item 6C. 6C, 6C, yes, okay. So this is our goals and work plan. Um, we've had this item on the agenda for many of our past NRC meetings. And, and the crux of the matter here really comes to how do we wanna organize ourselves to quote, get stuff done. Um, for a long time, the NRC was organized around these topic specific subcommittees so we had i think that you know those those six major areas were also how we had organized ourselves around subcommittees um we tried towards at some point last year and now i can't remember exactly when it was um to switch to more of an action oriented subcommittee structure um because the you know the the advantage of having topic specific subcommittees um is that you have like you can group people by expertise and then it means you have a couple of people who can sort of feel free to talk about you don't know you don't have to feel so constrained so brown act constrained it's kind of like okay if you're on an energy subcommittee that gives you pretty broad leeway to talk to your you know brown act buddies about energy stuff and how, how all the different energy components fit together so that's the advantage the disadvantage is that those don't really have uh, um, I think they fulfill the responsive side of the NRC's purview quite well but they don't necessarily fulfill the proactive side of the NRC's purview because there's not an objective that you're looking towards in addition like there are certain topics for instance energy can touch on sustainable transportation and EVs. I'm interested in sustainable transportation and EVs. I'm not so interested in energy efficiency. So it also was kind of crowding out individuals from engaging on one-off projects that they were interested in. Um, the disadvantage of the action-oriented subcommittee structure is exactly the opposite. It, is, you know, it does focus you on a specific goal and it, it means that the, only the people who the people who care about that thing are going to be on the people who are on that um, subcommittee but then it means that you're pretty narrow in what you can focus on it means that we have a proliferation of subcommittees that can be a little bit difficult to keep track of and it means um, importantly, that kind of that monitoring function is lost. So, um, you know, frequently, for instance, like, the, you know, the tree commission has their tree commission meetings, and it might be useful for somebody from the NRC to go be sitting in on a tree commission meeting every now and then. But um, if you don't have a tree subcommittee, it's not obvious who that that should be. Um, and so I think for this item, we want to have a discussion of that, recognizing that it's 8:45 already. Um, 
we can try and hope to keep this discussion somewhat contained. Um, it's always the hope. Um, I think that there are, I think my, my proposal based on seeing the pros and cons of those two different structures that we have tried in the two years that I've been on the commission is that we move towards having a bit of a blend where we have perhaps two person subcommittees um, around really key topic areas such as air quality, energy, water, perhaps we add one or two others to that list that are kind of like two member subcommittees that only just have a monitoring function, sort of a monitoring responsive function. And then we establish more ad hoc action oriented subcommittees as there is need and interest. Um, for instance, the leaf blower topic, which continues to come up is something that's very active. I was on our sort of previous like air quality subcommittee that started the leaf blower process rolling and then that transitioned into more of a leaf blower subcommittee. Um, and now I'm the only remaining member of that subcommittee. I am working with staff right now on the next steps on leaf blowers. And I would like to have a buddy or two helping me with that. So that's one specific um, thing that we probably need an action oriented subcommittee around. So that's that's where I'd like to move towards and that's that structure is what I'd like to be the subject of the discussion. Um, if, if people are sort of, and can jump the gun and say, if people are amenable to that structure, what I'd like to come out of with today is sort of assignments of people to a monitoring function, as well as creation of whatever ad hoc subcommittees we need at this exact moment. Um, but then recognizing that additional ad hoc action oriented subcommittees can certainly can and will be formed moving forward. Okay, um, I also recognize that I need to open public comment on this item. So let me do that and then I will stop talking and let other people talk. Okay, public comment, open and close. Oh, no, Alan, sorry. No, you did, yeah? Are you gonna sneak in there? Alan, floor is yours if you want it. Thank you. I just want to encourage the, the in your work plan for the coming year that the tree, the new tree ordinance, which is breaking right now, and public comment will close in 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 March. You you get you put that on a priority because this is your window. I know you've been involved with parking lots and cool parking lots and the PVM parking lots. This is your chance. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Let's so let's again kind of go in. Let's do sort of like clarifying questions first, and then I'll just open the floor for discussion. So um, anybody with a clarifying question where we're trying to get to with this item or anything that I talked about? Janet, do you have a list of the ongoing action-oriented subcommittees? Well, I don't think we have any. Right, I think we ended up dissolving all of them at the end of 2020 because for exactly this reason, recognizing that we were losing half of our committee membership. We didn't have that many to begin with. And then we kind of dissolved them all thinking that we would reconstitute them in the new year. Okay. The only well, one the I remember is the you, one you mentioned. If you, the leaf blower if, one. if I could comment, um, the first thing that you did before the end of 2020 was dissolve all of your topic area subcommittees in favor of specific subject subcommittees. And right, then, but I don't, do we still have any of those? No, I don't know that you have any standing, any subcommittees at yeah. all at this point. I think that's correct. I think we have some ideas of subcommittees that we might want to establish, but I don't think that we have any subcommittees right now. We're in the opposition of the majority of the commission. Voting the majority of the commission um, 
um, is not has not been clued in on what what we've been doing, and they can go anywhere they want. Not the voting majority. No, that's not true. Isn't there four new people and three? Yeah, old? but the, no, but the, no, there's four. There's four. Um, it's four and four. We have four old. Oh, with the alternate. Thank you. Yeah. Uh huh. So yes. Yeah, so if we want, John, you're correct that we can tyrannically take it over, and we can be like a small oligopoly. That's probably not quite right, but we're not UConn. Um, we can basically be the U.S. Senate. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, so clarifying question then. Now that yes. I understand there aren't any, because I, I was like digging through. I'm like, do I have a list? Yeah. I'm like no. trying to figure it out. Now that I understand there aren't any, um, maybe I need you to repeat exactly what you're looking for. You, I, I know there was the leaf blower. Is that the only one then you're looking so, for? So, yeah. So, so what I what i think what i what i think would be a good thing to move towards would be again to sort of establish to figure out a couple of key topic areas i mean i think i i think i know what they are i think they're kind of basically like energy water a climate change sustainability and potentially potentially air would be a separate one potentially waste would be a separate one though I'm not all that convinced that those must be separate. I, I sort of see water, energy, and climate change, even though, I mean, climate change is always so hard because it encompasses everything. But I would sort of have, or maybe waste actually with SB 1383, potentially I would have water, energy, climate, waste as four major topic areas to which I would assign two commissioners each to just be do a monitoring function. So then if there's like some kind of, you know, um, like meeting, let's say Valley Clean Energy is having a meeting that has something that's interesting to us, one or both of the energy people would have the responsibility to go to that. Um, then I think separately, there are a couple of um, priority areas around which it might be important or useful to have um, more action-oriented subcommittees. The one that it's absolutely critical is the leaf blower one because I want a buddy. Um, then I think a one that is almost as important as that is um, the, you know, the, I've heard the tree ordinance come up um, frequently throughout the evening. Um, I've looked at the draft tree ordinance and I think much of the draft tree ordinance does fall squarely into the tree commission's purview. It's quite technical um, and I don't think that there's that much for us to add there. I do think though that when it comes to um, elements, there is a part about, um, there's a section on parking lots and the NRC has previously put together a cool parking lot proposal and started to work with the tree commission on figuring out recommendations for parking lots that accommodate both trees and solar in as sustainable a way as possible. Um, and with the tree ordinance in draft form and parking lots as a section in there, I, I think that we probably need an action oriented subcommittee to follow up on that, there's also a part in the tree or tree ordinance about mitigation and sort of what and, and mitigation and climate mitigation does fall pretty squarely into our purview. So I think there's a couple of elements of the coal parking lot that could use some um, NRC folks being on top of. And then, you know, and then it is also, I don't want to dictate from the top down what we focus on. It is also an opportunity for especially our new commissioners who have come in, you know, you, you, I'm sure you have specific things that you're passionate about and that you can envision an action on and that, you know, but that you perhaps would like a little bit of help. And so, it is also an opportunity for people to bring up things that they would like to work on, though I don't think that that has to be done today. I know it's your first meeting. I know it's already nearing nine. Um, 
you know, that if in February you have an idea for a specific action that you'd like to pursue, certainly that could be brought up then. Um, Carrie, go so, ahead. Uh, yeah, Hannah. Um, I, I'd like to suggest that um, perhaps the thing to do would be for the new commissioners and, and uh, continuing commissioners to recognize that this is a big topic to address and they've gotten the work plan information and a little bit of what the background of the NRC has been and the whole idea of do we have standing subcommittees year by year or do we you know address things as they come up and perhaps what is needed is a staff report to to say here is what has happened in the past now take this and decide how you as the new commission wants to address it mm -hmm. i'm not sure that trying to make a decision today mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. so what I can offer to you as your staff liaison is to come up with a bit of a historical perspective on what have the, what is the charge of the NRC? What have the subcommittees been over the last say five years? And then you can decide what you, where you want to take that now. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's one possibility. Nothing is happening between now and February where mm -hmm. a subcommittee necessarily needs to meet other than potentially there may be some things coming up with staff on the one you mentioned, the leaf blower. Yes, I, there okay. are. Um, and I know of at least one new commissioner that is interested in that topic area. Mm -hmm. So others may be as well. John, what are your thoughts on that path forward? I think I think having what Carrie suggested would be nice. If I was a new commissioner, I'd like to have not be uh, railroaded onto a commission like I was my first meeting um, uh, many years ago. I would like to carry this conversation a little further, though, before we leave it tonight to get put some ideas on the table. Um, in fact. Actually, I would like to share a screen if I could. You can. Is that, is that possible? I think you should be able to. I have to, um, who's our- uh, do, you, do you have the, no, I think you should just be able to, John. Do you have the little share oh, screen button stop. at the bottom? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't have to request to stop. No. Okay. So I was, um, over the break, I was one of the proponents of trying to keep some kind of a monitoring um, standing committee in place. And so that Carrie, this might be stealing a little bit of your thunder, but I think it'll get people to think about something to think about when they're reading your thing. These were the, the top here is the five standing committees that we used to have and that uh, we dissolved in favor of action committees but are now thinking that maybe we need some people just to kind of keep an eye on certain topics on a regular basis to be the kind of the internal experts on certain topics. And I gave some thought to what those monitoring subcommittees might be. Um, and they, they closely follow what uh, Hannah was just saying, but it took me a little while to think it through. I mean, water has always been pretty pretty solid, excuse me, water has always been pretty clear. That's water and wastewater. What we found in the past, we had solid waste and hazardous materials and hazardous materials basically became uh, working with the uh, uh, pesticides and the IPM program in, in the city. And air quality and GHG, GHG kind of became energy. And I wondered if it'd be worthwhile to combine those into a, an environmental health topic that would have, because air quality and, and pesticides are both health oriented, whereas water and solid waste are kind of infrastructure oriented. And then I put down three others that kind of made some sense, but it was getting kind of, six was getting kind of long. I thought probably four would be a better, a better list. And I, but I put them down in case people had passions in the year of doing CAP, 
I think that we probably all need to be on the GHG monitoring committee <laughs> um, and, and uh, all be our own experts as much as we can. But we could consider if somebody has a passion for energy and, and continuing to push the building codes and the reach codes and the, and the renter uh, retrofit kinds of, of projects, that's, that kind of goes along with what we had before. Sustainable communities is a kind of a catch-all of uh, land use and CEQA and um, several other things that I heard tonight that I didn't quite, didn't, didn't quite in internalize. And then we've always talked about, but never actually done a standing committee on environmental justice or equity. And that topic has come up a lot um, tonight. So those are some ideas I'll throw out there for people to discuss or for Carrie to pick up and incorporate into her report. These are possibilities. Oh, and the idea, let me expound a little bit on monitoring. Uh, the idea is that there'd be two people and if somebody find, uh, they're, they're going to be the people who are kind of can, tracking over time the development of the of this issue so that uh, without, let me see, so that if city staff wants to have preliminary conversations or if something pops up in, in state law that you want to alert us to, uh, the idea would be that you would uh, just kind of keep watching this field and and bringing to NRC what's happening and um, uh, maybe leading taking the lead on um, discussions in those in those areas. But if you if we had a specific project like Leaf, then we have a separate committee. That's the Leaf Blower Committee, and and those can be from anybody. That's one of the reasons to make these only two: a person and a buddy so that we stay away from um, potential uh, serial meetings. Does that, does that make sense to the new commissioners? Meg, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, no, transportation came up a few times and is definitely seems like it will be important to the climate change action plan. And I was just wondering where that fits in this or if it's part of energy or part of climate change or, um, yeah. It's a little bit mostly the um, bike transportation street safety commission, BTSSC. Um, and so that's why transportation never comes up as a standalone for us because there's another commission for whom that is their direct purview. Um, and then, so it's a little bit, you know, of course, part of energy, it's part of air quality. We haven't also historically had like a real transportation nerd on the NRC, at least not while I've been on. Um, so that's, that's part of it too, because the transportation nerds tend to go to either planning or BTSSC. Um, but so it's a sort of a dual answer. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, um, in a previous conversation today with a new commissioner, I um, used the uh, example that while we have overlap with many other commissions, for example, with transportation, uh, the Bicycle Street Safety and Transportation Commission would address most of those issues that relate to um, all of, to those topics, but they don't necessarily address greenhouse gas emissions of transportation. So that is within the NRC's purview and the actual um, you know, transportation issues of buses, bikes, pedestrians, vehicles are the BTSSC's um, purview. So if there, I was, there, are, there is overlap. If I was going to put it into a standing committee, I probably would put it into here. You know, the, the you know, GHG from transportation. 
So were and you we pointing get, were you pointing to environmental health or sustainable communities? Communities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And with all due respect, respect that things. your your list is one approach. There may be other approaches. Exactly. And every time we have talked about committee structure in the NRC, it has been a very long conversation. So, um, you may have an idea, others may have an idea. Um, so, so I think Carrie's idea is a, is a good one uh, that, you know, since you're volunteering Carrie to put together a staff report that puts a little bit more of the history in writing. Um, it, it, I don't hear any flaming objections to trying to move towards sort of a four pillared, hopefully, monitoring structure that covers most things. I don't think it'll be entirely comprehensive, but it'll kind of get most of our big, stop most of the big things from falling through the cracks and then do some ad hoc action oriented committees as needed. Um, I think we could talk more than next month, you know, people can mull on it a little bit, read Carrie's memo and think about what might be possible monitoring structures as well as consider whether they have specific action items that they would want to propose um, an ad hoc subcommittee be established around whether now or later. Um, I do want a buddy for leaf blowers now. I also think that with um, the tree ordinance comment period closing in March, it wouldn't be a terrible thing to establish a cool parking lots subcommittee um, that, that I would love to volunteer John for, like John and one other person for the sake of just trying, even if nothing necessarily gets done too much between now and February, just for the sake of trying to do a little bit of um, knowledge transfer and, and orientation. I think that would be useful. Go ahead, Michelle. But I uh, just want to interject a little bit um, going backwards. I am a little bit yeah. of a transportation nerd and I am Excellent. definitely <laughs> interested in transportation, especially as it pertains to land use and um, greenhouse gases. So just put me on that that note, if you will, and, right on. and the same thing with solid waste, which I also see as being a actually connected. So, um, and when we say infrastructure, that can mean anything. I just want to also put that out there that you have water infrastructure, solid waste infrastructure, mm -hmm. energy. That that does that's not a very good umbrella for me. Um, and I'm interested in doing either one, leaf blower or um, the parking lot thing. So probably parking lot a little Because I Because I'm getting, I, I've been getting the whole time that Kira is the one who wants to do leaf yes. blowers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, that was, uh, <laughs> I think about that every single day. I see leaf blowers every day and I'm like, ah, so yeah. Yeah, it, it, so, um, so maybe we can do that. Maybe we can have Kira work with me on leaf blowers and, John and Michelle that you guys can tag up on just where cool parking lots is at. I know John that you're always constantly oversubscribed but my hope is that you can again just do that knowledge transfer and then somebody else can pick up the reins from you. I like that okay. Yeah um, and then Richard and David I also want to just as, as there are other sort of veteran commissioners I want to make sure you guys have the opportunity to weigh in right now with, with any thoughts that you might have? Well, I have been following the parking lot um, initiative. And in fact, before I was on the NRC, sure. yeah. I mm -hmm. was working with John and my wife on, <laughs> on that one. Um, so I, I would probably like to get back on that one, especially yeah. since it sounds like Great. it's now come back to resurfaced. Great, uh, yeah. So. I'm happy to let Richard do that. <laughs> well, maybe we can put all three of you on. All right. I'm kind of gearing towards uh, sustainable communities, environmental justice. I don't know exactly what a working group around that would look like, but um, 
something along those lines. So let's put a pin in that, David, because I think I, I think having a, having that be a focus this year is a really is is really important. But let's I think when it comes to the if we, if we're on board with again sort of establishing our monitoring subcommittees and then doing ad ad the ad hoc action oriented subcommittees, then I think we can wait until next time to sort of finalize the monitoring subcommittee structure and then do assignments beyond that. I would also say yeah, that I sounds great. I would say that um, there's a likelihood we're gonna have to create subcommittees for the cap mm -hmm. on specific topics anyway. Right. There's no, so and and that won't be clearly one that we'll want to have. Right. Okay. So, so I think we have a plan. Um, Carrie, do we have to do a formal thing to establish these two subcommittees right now? We do. Uh, yes, I believe that if you are reforming um, or creating subcommittees, it would be good to have destroy the business. A, um, who wanted, who wanted to... I know. Well, it makes perfect sense. Commission they action. Destroy the business. They can't be credible. No one's credible. So somebody, somebody's got some something going on in the background. Uh, uh, Jennifer, could you uh, bring Alan to be not of, sharing? He should lose his license. Yes. No. Alan's no. voice is Alan Hirsch's there voice. There we go. Is, great. Um, yeah, so if you could have a motion for the leaf blower subcommittee and a motion for the cool parking lot tree ordinance subcommittee, that would be great. Okay, I'll make that motion to form the former with myself and Kira and the latter with John, Michelle, and Richard. Second. Okay, fantastic. And we can vote. Who seconded? It was Tom. Thank you, Tom. Okay, John. Aye. I'll be an aye. Meg? I wasn't prepared to vote aye. That's okay. <laughs> it's because because people keep moving around. I like to keep everyone on their toes. Um, Am I? Oh, sorry. Do, oh, you're, so, I'm sorry. You're the <laughs> alternate. That's why you weren't prepared to vote. My bad. <laughs> that really kept you on your toes. Good work. <laughs> Consider it a test. Okay, Tom? Aye. Uh, Kira? Aye. Michelle? Aye. David? Aye. Richard? Aye. Okay, great. And so we have that formal motion and then sort of informal assignment to think on, again, I think, I think it'd be great if we could keep it to sort of four monitoring subcommittees, but if we had to add a fifth, that would be okay. So think on that for our next meeting and Carrie will um, do a little write up on, on the history of our many failed attempts to <laughs> build a workable subcommittee structure. Um, okay, and let's close out this agenda item. Um, and we are getting to the end of it. We need to do our 6D where we're gonna talk about the environmental recognition awards. We may have another subcommittee formation coming right up. So we'll do our talking about the ERAs um, and then touch on the long range calendar and then we'll be out of here. Okay, Carrie, you're up. Thanks. Um, so I don't have a staff report or an overview on this, but um, just a verbal one. Um, what I would like to say is that the NRC has had, I believe, well, it's been over 20 years of uh, having created the Environmental Recognition Awards which is a really long legacy of recognizing um, organizations and individuals within the community that have done significant works to um, improve the um, sustainability of the city of Davis. And um, I think that um, it would be great, even in this uh, pandemic situation to uh, have another year of environmental recognition awards. So I don't know that anybody is against that, but we do need to consider, are we going to move forward with another year? Last year, the process of environmental recognition awards 
was initiated before the sort of COVID lockdown. And um, we had a number of uh, environmental recognitions, but because of COVID, we didn't really have the full um, sort of like uh, public meeting to give the awards um, to, uh, to the individuals that received them. So typically there are three categories of the environmental recognition awards. There's business, there's nonprofit um, or sort of government agency type groups, and there are individual or small group categories. So last year um, after, and, and what I will say is that in the last five years, we have had significant participation in this, um, in this program. We've had between 12 and 20 submittals from the community for environmental recognition awards as managed by the Natural Resources Commission, which is just a wonderful acknowledgement of how excited our community is about sustainability and environmental recognition. So last year in the business category, I'll just give you an overview of who um, was selected. Nugget Market was uh, very renowned for some of the work that they've done in sustainability. In the nonprofit category, Cool Davis was recognized for their 10 years of work in um, uh, helping the city as a partner in um, uh, sustainability and outreach. Um, and in the individual category, there were a number of individuals and small groups that were recognized. So the um, in the basic category, we have Jean Jackman, who is a longtime Davis resident and has done so much um, with the Sierra Club and birding and um, all sorts of different things. She was recognized in that category, as well as the group that actually Richard was referring to earlier um, of either um, pre-utility commission members or while they were utility commission members that helped start the um, community choice um, energy group and which ended up with uh, Valley Clean Energy that was Greg Braun, Lorenzo Christoph, and Richard um, McCann were recognized. So that was one set of the individual group. And then we had special recognitions in the environmental and youth category. So we had um, Crystal Waters and Deb Bruns both recognized. So a total of five awards in three, oh no, that's one, two, six awards in three categories plus the Legacy Award, which was started in the um, City of Davis's 100th anniversary, which recognizes longstanding efforts in the community toward um, sustainability. And last year, what was recognized was our um, very broad-based um, uh, recycling, composting, and, and um, reuse area. So, the whole waste removal um, and solid waste issue. That was a bit long-winded, but what we would like the commission to decide tonight is one, do we want to do a 2021 awards? Two, do we want to renovate and update the awards to have the commission be more integrally involved with establishing the outreach and information about the awards. And three, potentially for that sub, to establish a subcommittee of two to three commissioners and decide whether that sub subcommittee is going to recommend some additional funding to make all of this happen. So Hannah, let me know if that gave an, a good enough overview of the Environmental Recognition Awards. Um, it gave a good rep overview to me, but I already knew what they were. And so, so <laughs> does anybody who doesn't know what they are have questions? 
Oh, hey, hold on. Okay, let's open public comment. Okay, we don't have any attendees. Excellent. Okay, let's close public comment. Okay, now does anybody have any questions? Gary, could you clarify what you meant about the funding and your, your second two items? I think that there have been some internal comments, maybe not the full commission, but one person has sent me a recommendation um, that, first of all, the existing funding for the Environmental Recognition Awards is like $150. I don't know the exact number, but it's a very low number, which basically goes to the um, reception following a um, city council meeting, which last year, obviously, we did not have. Um, so the idea of funding would be to do something different in this COVID area, era, like a video or interviews with potential oh, okay. authorities or something else. So there would be some costs associated with however the awards would be promoted, um, recognized, and celebrated, as well as the fact that um, at City Hall, where nobody can go into right now, there are some plaques on the wall, but they are outdated and need, there's no more space on the plaques for new um, awardees to be acknowledged. So we need to decide, are we gonna keep doing year by year plaques? Or are we gonna do a revisit to a larger plaque? So, and I don't know what the commission would want to recommend. I mean, maybe the plaques go out the window and we don't have one and it's based on social media or I'm not sure where we go with this in this new era, but a subcommittee of the commission could address some of these issues and decide whether some small amount of funding would be necessary. Thanks. So I think the main action tonight is one, decide if you want to do the awards and two, appoint a subcommittee of two or three people to work on it with staff. So I'm, you know, in, in notionally in favor of the ERAs, you know, they're, they're fun, they're great. I like recognizing people, for stuff they're doing. I don't have the bandwidth to contribute to this. So that if there are people who have the bandwidth to contribute and make it great. That's fantastic. Um, and if not, that's okay. It's my thinking. Can I ask a question about timing, Carrie? Is that would the would the suggest would your suggestion be that we, if we had the awards, time them again for April to go along with Earth Day? which would mean that we would want a committee, I guess a committee during February and March to make recommendations based on nominations. And then a committee from now until February to make a recommendation about the general direction. Is that what you're uh, suggesting? I think Carrie got disconnected for a second. Now she's on mute. She might not know that. Yes, we I was. Um, I had a disconnect for a moment based on connectivity, but I'm back. So I apologize. I missed a couple minutes. All right. Let me repeat then. So I was. I was. Paraphrasing, I think what you were asking, and I, I wanted you to verify that 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 the the work would be a subcommittee between now and February to advise us on whether to go forward, um, and then a, and then a, a an award picking subcommittee between February and March, so that the award could be given by the city 
council in April uh, to correspond with Earth Day. That's been the past schedule. Are you suggesting the same thing? It sounded like you said I was suggesting two separate subcommittees for the Environmental Recognition Awards. No, I, I didn't mean suggest, to. I would suggest yeah. a single subcommittee of two or three commissioners to address all of the topics that were just brought up. I, I would suggest first a commission motion and vote on having the awards and second formation of a subcommittee to address all of the issues between now and Earth Day for um, acknowledgement of the awardees by council in April. Well, we probably don't want to vote on whether or not to have the awards until we find out whether or not there's anybody on the commission who has the bandwidth to support them. So, so I will put, I, I have will a question about a that. Plug. What's that? I just had a question about that. Um, is this like whoever signs up for it on the NRC, are they responsible for providing all the infrastructure for the awards or is that done by staff? Like what, I'm just curious if we can get clarification on what we'd be signing up for if we were to start a subcommittee. Right. So typically, so thank you, David. So typically um, the subcommittee has just been responsible for review of the, so staff has done all of the work to announce the awards, um, uh, set up the structure for um, submittals of applications and support the commission in doing all of that. And then the, the subcommittee has simply reviewed the awards that were submitted and selected the awardees for approval by the full commission and then to be sent to the city council. I am recommending to you a slightly more proactive role, which might include determining how do we make this a um, very vibrant set of awards in the COVID era. That's not necessary to decide to continue with the Environmental Recognition Awards. It could be done in exactly the same format it, as it has been done before, where staff has put out um, a call for um, applications and has managed everything up to the point of handing over the completed applications to a, an NRC subcommittee who spends an hour looking at them and deciding on them and then staff brings those recommendations to the NRC. So there's a wide range of what a subcommittee could do. Um, so again, the key is one for the um, NRC to decide, yes, we would like to do with that with a minimum of a one hour commitment by a subcommittee to review the applications. And then the subcommittee it could sell, itself could decide, no, we'd like to do a little bit more. That's very helpful, thank you. I, I am not hearing volunteers for an ERA um, subcommittee, which, which again, I think is, I mean, this is my, my personal opinion. I think that is fine. You know, I would, I would throughout, I would rather have people be volunteering for stuff that they know they have the capacity to do and are interested in doing. Um, so, so I so I think then not hearing anybody volunteering for it, then I think it's a no. 
Um, I have a suggestion. If sure. the ERA wards are not done, could we perhaps give an award to like Healthy Davis together or something like that for uh, being like proactive with environmental health this year? Just like a special award because of the situation we're in? I think we could decide as a commission to, to you know, to, to make that recommendation. Um, I don't think that we would directly, we, we would not as the commission directly give the awards. We don't actually directly give the ERAs. We just, you know, sort of say to council, here's who we think should get them. And then um, council typically takes that. So I think we could, you know, make some kind of a different type of recommendation. Sure, there's nothing stopping us from making that kind of recommendation. I, I think the key I think, would I be- think Hannah's, I think Hannah's right that there's nothing stopping the NRC from doing a different process, but the, the framework for the environmental recognition awards to date has been that this is a community generated um, award system. The NRC has hosted the awards. They have selected those that would get the awards, but they are not saying, oh, well, we, the NRC, think this group and this group and this individual should get an award. And so um, while it really is the NRC's decision um, as I said, the bare minimum is for two people to commit to one hour of review <laughs> of nominations that come in. And it is a very long, I, I, have a, I have a strong bias that this is a great um, service to the community that has been longstanding. And yet it is not my decision, it is your decision. Um, the additional tasks that were identified tonight were more, you know, you could make it a larger um, commitment, but there is no need for a larger commitment in order to have um, the awards be available during this pandemic time. Carrie, are the other city awards being given this year? I do not know. I I assume so, although I haven't seen any um, advertisements for the other awards that are given. Gloria may know something more than I do. They typically hit in March, April, May, and so they may not be um, advertised yet. Hannah, you have two hands raised. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. I'm on my attendee page. Okay. Yeah, Meg, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say if it's a matter of being on a committee to kind of review the applications and be involved as it comes closer, I'm happy to volunteer for that. Um, I just that I don't I'm not really familiar with this, so I didn't really I don't really have a opinion on changing it from years before. So I was kind of hesitant to get involved, but um I, yeah, I'm happy to do that. You got one, Carrie. Tom, go ahead. Uh, I would join Meg. All right, we did it. <laughs> we pulled, we pulled teeth, and we got two. Wait, or so, or or twisted arms, pulled teeth, twisted arms. They're both the same kind of metaphor. So Thank do you. you want to do you want a motion that we continue the ER a consistent with past practice and that we um, us, um, um, uh, designate Meg and Tom as the um, reviewing committee, nominations okay. reviewing committee. Right, with the, to do, tasked with doing either the bare minimum or more. <laughs> yes, and I think that you could just establish the subcommittee at this point. Um, yes. Sounds because good. Decision, uh, it, it seems like there's a, a bit of an acclamation that you will move forward if you have people that will do it and you now have two people that will do it. So you can just establish the subcommittee. That was okay. that was the motion 
motion I just made. Was okay, I'm second. I made. second. I second John's motion. Okay, John. Aye. Hannah, it's aye. Tom. Aye. Kira. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Richard. Aye. David. Aye. Okay. Excellent. Great work. Okay. That's the end of our agenda. Now we just have to do our little like closing business. Okay. So we have our uh, long range calendar. Um, like I said, we usually just touch base on it at the end of our meeting. Um, so next month we have the long range calendar FYI is attached, should be in your meeting packet. Um, but so next week, uh, next week, God, that would be terrible. Um, next month, we uh, will have an update from Cool Davis, which has been uh, like some months in the waiting. Um, and then we'll receive and comment on the water loss audit report. We will also um, add to that long range calendar, the continuation of the subcommittee planning that we started tonight. Um, and then looking more into the future, um, this this calendar will get more filled up, especially as the cap starts to develop. But we would then um, review the ERA nominations in March. Apparently in March, we're electing the chair vice chair. That's exciting. Um, and then potentially by then we'll have some stuff to report on leaf blowers. So I actually expect that we'll have some stuff to report on leaf blowers um, next month, whether that rises to the level of a full agenda item or not, I don't know. Um, Okay, and then anything for communications, et cetera? Uh, no, I just, in the in a subsequent email to the um, one that was sent out with the full meeting materials, I added the information I had just received from the Yellow um, Food Bank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of there was some thought at the time that they um, made their presentation a number of months ago that there would be a follow up item on the agenda and some of the information that they provided seemed to be recommendations that the Commission may want to address at some future time. I'm not sure that it is a pressing matter to address in February, especially since staff is moving forward with recommendations on SB 33 yeah. with a consultant, but I just wanted to acknowledge that that information was added today to the communications. Yeah, could you put that, Carrie, on the unscheduled items part of the long range calendar so we don't lose track of it? Yes, I will do that. Okay, anything else for the good of the group? Okay, great. Um, and I would say that being only 37 minutes over is a smashing success. Good work, everyone. Okay. Um, the members should be aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be aware and be warned. That went great. Okay, and then uh, and then I think we move to adjourn, but, but then we don't have to vote on it. Then we can all just be and be happy about that. So I'll move to adjourn and then we can just sort of do it by acclamation. Huzzah. Okay. It was um, great to meet everybody, um, you know, virtually if, um, you know, especially for new commissioners, if you have specific questions that you want to address with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to shoot me an email or if you want to get together at a social distance, perhaps perhaps not this week with the weather but in the future i'm also very happy to do that as well um just don't don't hesitate to reach out but excited to have you all on board okay take care everyone have a good night thanks Hi, thank good night you. everybody thanks carrie good night Great, Jennifer. So can you um, turn off the streaming? Yeah, hold on a moment.